B9 begins in a place with a red alert on, surrounded by fallen people and despair everywhere. In the midst of this, a boy named Yojuri walks calmly through the corridor, seemingly unconcerned with the chaos around him, until he stands in front of a camera and asks where a woman named Asaka is. Right in front of him, the entrance to a room opens, and there is the woman Yojuri is looking for, being threatened by another, who is pointing a gun at her. The boy approaches the situation as if he doesn't understand what's happening, welcoming the woman as if she doesn't have a gun aimed at her head. The aggressor tells the boy to step back or the worst could happen, but at that moment, the boy triggers a mysterious effect that instantly eliminates the armed woman. Seeing the scene, Asaka questions what that was, but before she could reflect more on the matter, Yojuri hugs the girl and calls her back home. After this, we see that Yojuri was just dreaming while his friend, Tamachika Denura, tries to wake up the boy in a hurry. Yojuri is still sleepy on the school bus, but the girl can't believe that he can sleep in the situation they are in, with a gigantic dragon massacring her classmates. Without being sure if he still thinks he's dreaming, the protagonist throws a microphone at the creature's tail, which was piercing a student, until the monster startles with the audacity and turns back towards the bus, threatening to breathe fire at the two humans. However, before any harm could reach them, Yojuri opens an imaginary portal in his mind, and his eyes burn with a contained flame, and as soon as he opens his mouth, the huge dragon dies in the blink of an eye. Denura is safe, but she can't understand how that monster simply fell without a reasonable explanation, and furthermore, Yojuri remains oblivious to the gravity of the situation, then proceeds to turn on his Nintendo to play. Incredulous, the girl starts to protest that the man is unable to talk about all this like a normal person, but as Yojuri is busy crushing a red dragon, the young woman gives up getting worked up and tries to convince her classmate to run off the bus. Seeing that the girl has calmed down, Yojuri puts away the game and asks what the heck is going on. Thus, Denura explains that the whole class was on that bus, heading for an excursion. However, after passing through a tunnel, on the other side was a sunny landscape, and for no apparent reason, an unknown girl gets on the bus and introduces herself to everyone as Cheyenne, the stage. One of the organizers of the excursion asks what this girl is doing there, but she ignores the question and blows up the man, continuing the conversation, emphasizing that the students should pay attention only to her and nothing else. She explains that she has no intention of hurting anyone, but if anyone says anything, they will regret it. After all, the little sage's attack power is 530,000, and anyone who challenges that has certainly thrown their life in the trash. Apparently, this was a joke on her part, but since no one laughed, she decided to massacre the bus driver just because the audience's ignorance annoyed her. After that, she tells those present that they are in an ice kai, also known as a kind of parallel world, and that she summoned them all as potential sages. This world is ruled by this class, so sometimes it is important to replenish some numbers that were lost. Then Shine invokes a magic similar to a rainbow and envelops the students with an installation called Battle Song, where each user can see their own statistics and the class to which they belong according to the person's talent. However, as Danura did not receive this installation, she asks her friend Maikoki what she is seeing, and she was placed in the necromancer class. According to Cheyenne, the aspirants will have a month to become sages, otherwise only God knows what will happen to the failures. Seeing that it might end up being her, Danara raises her hand and comments that she was left out of the selection, but the sage makes it clear that the girl does not have the necessary gift to participate in the process. Despite this, perhaps out of pure sadism, Cheyenne warns that Denora also needs to become a sage, otherwise she will become a mere cattle in the farm of life. Finally, the sage sets a one-hour limit to complete the first mission, then gets off the bus and leaves. Confused, Denora sits next to Maikoki to see what's going on, and the friend tells her that the first objective is to get rid of a level 1000 dragon that is coming to attack. However, ironically, the regulations themselves state that no one there is capable of facing an enemy of that level at the stage they are in. Next, a guy named Suguru Yazaki leads the group and showing leadership skills. He calls his colleagues to show their abilities and form a strategy for the task. Meanwhile, Yojuri is in the seventh heaven and stays out of the team formation. Denura notices that besides her, two other classmates were without the battle song, Ayaka Shinozaki and Yuichiro Kiryu. For this reason, they were forced to stay inside the bus while everyone involved with the installation left under Yazaki's leadership who, when dealing with the revolt of the excluded, shows that those who receive the gift have their physical abilities enhanced even at the first level. And with that strength, he breaks two seats of the bus and blocks the passage outside because, according to him, the excluded have no special abilities, so they will be a burden to the others. Danara thinks differently and believes that the privileged should protect the weaker ones, but the group leader is insistent in his response, revealing that this is a strategy, and calls Asuba Koriyama, the beauty coordinator, to cast a charm on all the excluded, making them attractive to the dragon and consequently, bait to be eaten, while the rest of the group gains time to reach the city. 
In a panic, Ganera finds it absurd and questions if the leader decided this alone as no one in their right mind would accept it. Mekochi surely voted against it. However, Yazaki responds quite curtly that Dinner's friend agreed to the plan, and after that, he locks the renegades in the bus and continues with his strategy. Shortly after, the dragon had already flown over the car and slaughtered Shinazaki and Kiryu, leaving only the last two rejects after Yojiri woke up from his beauty sleep and killed the winged monster with the power of thought. And speaking of the guy, even after hearing this whole story about sages in a parallel world with creatures that spit fire, all that concerned him was how he would recharge his Nintendo in that isekai. However, after Danura complained about this indifference, he gets up and realizes that if they believe Yazaki, then there is only one dragon to be slain and since that one has turned to dust, it might be safe to go outside. Despite this observation, Danura still seemed concerned about why they were in this place and Yojiri suggests the version that they crashed the bus and everyone is dead. The girl doesn't like this idea, but the guy is convinced when he says she doesn't have to believe him if she doesn't want to. So the two get out of the car and are faced with three path choices, mountain, city, or forest. Yogjuri dismisses the forest right away, but before advancing his reasoning, Danura sees three students approaching through the air. Yogjuri recommends they knock down the birds as a precaution, but Danura responds that nowhere is it written that you need to kill three classmates just because they are flying towards you. Speaking of them, the healer of the group, Hanakawa, regrets that the girl is still alive because it ruined their plan to turn her corpse into a zombie. Higashiga, the hero class, had warned that it wasn't certain the girl was dead, while Fukuhara, the necromancer, always found the idea of controlling the poor thing like an undead somewhat strange. As expected, Danura realizes that they did not come in friendship, but before she can act, Higashida launches a fireball that devastates a mountain 100 meters away, considering a warning for the girl not to resist. When asked why they want to kidnap the victim, the three aspirants imply that they want to use Danura for some malicious games. Therefore, Yojiro knew he needed to put them in a negotiating position, so he used the weapon of dialogue on the rival leader, Higashida. He points his index finger at the hero and utters the word, die. Watching the scene, the two companions burst into laughter because of the guy's hilarious attitude. However, the joke ends when Hikashida drops dead instantly. Astonished, the two remaining partners ask what Yojiri did, and without hesitation, he coldly replies that he told Higashida to die, and he died. From what they saw, it wasn't very difficult to understand, but it seems Fukuhara didn't want to take it seriously when Yojiri told no one to move, and when the necromancer went to see if his friend was still alive, he ended up with the same fate. Finally, the assassin repeats the same order to the remaining boy, Hanakala, and the healer decides to play statue instantly. Thus, the overpowered one finally has the chance to explain his ability. First, he has the chubby one check if the other two are really dead. Then, Hanakawa tries to heal his friends, but in vain because they really went to a better place. Second, the protagonist even complains that it's a pain to explain this, but in a summarized way, he reveals that his ability is called instant death for any target. If he simply thinks of killing someone, that person dies immediately. Hanakawa responds that such a thing does not exist, and Yojiri asks if he wants to serve as the last evidence. The healer hesitates, but still tries to take advantage of an opportunity to attack the enemy, but Yojiri can also identify any intent to eliminate him, so the attack could not have succeeded. In fact, he can kill the target just by thinking of eliminating Yojiri. That is, it seems that nothing can go right against this guy, he is the very definition of overpower. In this case, all that's left is to sit and cry, and that's exactly what Hanakawa does. And to mock them, Yojiri asks why these three were so proud of these basic talents, and Hanakawa responds that it's not the first time they've entered this world. Not long ago, the mage from the kingdom of Amen summoned them to defeat the demon lord, and after they spent a year there and completed the mission, they returned to the real world. Yoji returns to Dinura and both comment that they didn't even realize that those three had been absent from school for all this time, but Hanakawa was willing to maintain his heroic pose, so he clarifies that time passes differently there, and as soon as they return to Earth, only a few hours had passed. Soon, Yojiri discovers that there is a chance to go back and raises his hand against the victim, who pleads for her life to the point of asking Danura to convince Lord Takatu to give up this idea. However, as he was the one who saved her life, she doesn't think she has to give her opinion on this problem. Thus, as a last resort, the Mark for Death guy takes out a rare artifact that promises to enslave the user, subjecting him to all the wills of the first person he encounters. Soon, he puts on the collar and starts to humiliate himself for his new mistress, Danura, but the girl found the guy's approach a bit disgusting and tells him to step back, tightening the leash. She tries to pass the ownership of the healer to Yojiri, but he cries just at the thought of not being enslaved by Lady Tomochika. Despite that, the exchange was already done and Yojiri promises not to kill the poor guy after this pathetic humiliation, 
but he sends the guy into a forest full of evil beasts just for him to see something real quick. So before he leaves, the master instructs the servant to leave behind everything of value and face with an obscene amount of adventure gold, Hanakoe obeys his lord's order and heads into the woods. When asked if the healer couldn't be useful, Yojiro responds that the guy could betray them at any moment. Hearing this, Denora asks if she couldn't do the same, but the protagonist seems aware of it and prefers to take the risk. Surprised, his companion wants to know the reason for this, as they've never been ones to talk much. However, the young man seems not to have a good reason for it. But after a few reflective seconds, he remembers when Denora hugged him at the moment when the dragon was about to attack them. On that occasion, the girl's embrace made him feel the voluminous softness of her water balloons, and in response, Denora curses her savior. And in the meantime, an enigmatic floating castle, Yuchi, the assistant to the wise Cheyenne, reports on the first mission of the new potential sages. The mission was successfully completed, but there were four fatalities. Cheyenne quickly thinks that the four renegades were the ones who died, but the assistant reveals that, in fact, only two outcasts were eliminated. In addition to these, two more of rank S, as the more experienced ones died suddenly. Perhaps this is the work of instant death magic. However, despite the seriousness of the matter, Cheyenne doesn't pay much attention to the problem and leaves it to Yuichi to act as he sees fit. So after a long walk, the protagonists reach the city. Despite Denora's excitement, Takatu is just eager to take a nap. Nevertheless, the guards are closing the gate, but the girl is in a hurry and tries to convince them to let them in. Instead of letting them in, the guards put the duo under the watch of Masahiko, a city representative. He questions how this second group of candidates appeared alone after the entire group had already arrived. Takatu explains that they got separated from the larger group. Masahiko seems bothered by the story and clarifies that they would usually charge a toll from the boys, but they were instructed not to mess with sage candidates. The protagonist ignores the fuss and mentions they heard about a capital, asking how they can get there. Masahiro seizes the opportunity and retorts that they were told not to interfere with the candidate's path, but no one said they couldn't help them. Takatu sarcastically thanks for the help and leaves, but the representative goes further, suggesting that the girl could spend the night at his mansion. Danura is embarrassed, pulls Takatu away, and they run off. Some time later, Danura feared that Takatu might have to kill that man. On the other hand, he feels offended and asks if she thinks he's some kind of lunatic. She responds that the part of him that hasn't realized that is the most charming. After that, they start exploring the city. Danura is excited that the place looks like it's from a fantasy movie with people resembling animals. Mairyu, one of them, greets the two outsiders and asks if everything's meow with them. As it seems to be their first time there, she also asks if they have problems or another kind of meow. Without answering the questions, Takatu asks what she wants. The cat gets straight to the point expressing her desire to be close to sage candidates because they have a promising future and are easy to seduce. Danura comments that the cat is very direct, but Mariu clarifies that she would never hit on a guy with a girlfriend. She adds that the key to success is developing a very male friendship with the candidates. Takatu asks what she thinks about bringing the cat along. As she wanted to take a look at the city before dark, they decide to go with Mariu. However, this outing turns bad as the cat convinces Denora to buy a bunch of expensive things she'll never use, only to end up cornered by a gang of anthropomorphs in the dead of night. The gang leader, the only human, mocks Takatu for being so calm in such a situation. When asked if they want money, the boss says it's one of the goals, but the main course is talentless sage candidates. Takatu confirms he understands their objectives, but will have to eliminate them. Concerned, Denora tries to warn Mariu that the guy isn't to be messed with, but she dismisses it as a stupid bluff, saying two weaklings without Dom can't do anything in this situation. Then Takatu gives the first command, and the row of enemies behind them falls lifeless. He commands the leopard man to die halfway, but by the way he fell, Takatu notices that even halfway is too much. So he decides to control this power more and nullifies the right ankle of the rooster and the left arm of one of the dogs. Obviously, the rest of the henchmen were already terrified and even Denura suggests that Takatu is going too far, but he responds with indifference, stating that when he tried to go easy, nobody paid attention. Therefore, he attacks the two eyes of another dog, and when the lizard tries to attack, he quickly deals with him too. Witnessing such madness, Miryu asks Takatu what kind of male he is exactly, but the boy responds that he doesn't even know. Sumini evaluates if his measured abilities were useful, but concludes that it's not efficient to destroy specific parts of someone's body. Plus, he doesn't like the feeling of intentionally torturing someone. Mariu panics and pleads for her life, mentioning her siblings at home, but Takatu argues that it doesn't justify kidnapping and selling people. Then he raises his right index finger and commands the end for both, but instead, nothing happens. 
Faced with a stroke of luck, the two thugs swim to freedom while Takatu watches their escape without a reaction. Denura tries to understand, asking if he let them go, but he says it wasn't the intention. Meanwhile, the two villains are running as fast as they can, and Miryu continues to wonder who the hell that kid is. But before any conclusion, her life is taken along with the bosses. She falls from the roof where she was hiding, and her last regret was getting involved with those criminals. Finally, the protagonist duo tries to get out of there before any trouble arises. However, the city guard led by George and at Delgar is already there, wanting to ask some questions to the two wrongdoers. Takatu takes charge of the interrogation, explaining that they were just passing through and everyone else was already on the ground. However, Adelbert caught the boy in the act as she saw the bandits fall at the moment they were about to attack Takatu. This leaves Danara furious for being labeled as suspicious, while the city guard, supposedly witnessing everything, did absolutely nothing to intervene. However, Albert explains that she was trying to trace the buyers of humans from this gang. Finally, she adds that it's better for those candidates not to raise a finger against the guard because they possess the protection of the wise, so the gift does not affect them. Yet Jorga's appraisal skill identified that neither of those two has the gift, meaning it's difficult to assert that they could really take down an entire gang. With this, Adelbert gives up and leaves, but before that, George apologizes for the captain's ignorance and Takatu asks the guard to find a place for them to spend the night. Despite this, Adelbert ends up finding one of the henchmen alive, the dog that ended up blinded. Still, the two protagonists finally have a moment of peace, hosted in a hotel that looks like a castle, according to Denura, although she has never seen one in her life. As for the rooms, Takatu asks if they can share one. But since the girl finds that a bit too much, he asks her to at least arrange a room next to his. She enters her huge room, and as soon as she jumps on the bed, she questions what idea Takatu had about sharing the room. Upon reflection, she realizes that they've been together every second in that world and wonders if he might like her, even though he only made it clear that he likes one specific thing about her. But the reflection ends when a spirit invades the room. Despite the initial scare, Denera seemed more scared by the fact of finding this spirit in this world, as she asks what the older sister is doing there. Then, the spirit is offended by being compared to that figure and introduces itself as Mokomoko Denura, wife of the founder's son of Denura school, known as the restorer of the school and protector of the Denura family, ancestor of Tamachika Denura and guardian spirit. After this flood of description, Tamachika asks the spirit to take it easy, or she won't be able to keep so much information in her head. Later, Mokomoko warns that Tamachika is in great danger, so she had to appear to her help. But as she has been through a lot to get there, the young girl wonders why the guardian spirit didn't appear earlier when she was in the thick of it. Mokomoko explains that she was afraid of that guy Takatu because if she appeared out of nowhere in front of him, she risked being erased from the face of the earth as his ability works even with paranormal beings. For this reason, Tamachika Denura must inform the boy tomorrow about the existence of the ghost's sister, because only then the spirit will be able to stay safe. Furthermore, she reveals that she can protect Tomochika from everything except physical attacks. In fact, she prevented the installation of the battle song in the girl. As Yojuri was upset about being left without it, Mokomoko explains that that installation has certain advantages, it's true. But once installed in the mind, the wise ones gain control over you. Finally, she confesses that she would love to take away the successor of Danura Archery School. A mixed martial art practice since the Heian Dynasty. But since Tamachika is stuck in this world depending on Taka 2, the spirit decides to teach the true art of Danura and names this mission Operation. My guardian spirit is the strongest. No one in this other world has a chance against him. The next morning, Danura was exhausted, and when she meets Taka 2 again, a receptionist named Celestina informs that since yesterday she had been trying to locate their classmates as well as preparing the language translation, status concealment items, and even arrange a charger for Taka 2's Nintendo. Finally, she gives the boys two tickets to the capital, departing tomorrow at noon. Moreover, she accepts the boys' request to guard all his treasure, and as she even did that, Danura is amazed at the efficiency of this worker. The next morning, the group heads to the new city, and Tamachika is wondering why she is turning the crank of a portable game charger inside the ghostly stomach of a guardian spirit from the high-end dynasty. In the meantime, Mokomoko makes it clear that she does not take up physical space so the young girl can relax. Because of that, Tamachika asks the spirit to sit next to Takatu, but the old apparition is still terrified of the boy. Therefore, he calms the ghost and reveals that he has been able to see her since Tamachika warned him of her existence, and in any case, Tamachika can also sit next to him if she's uncomfortable. With that done, Yajiri Takatu informs that Celestina, the receptionist, thinks their classmates are near the primitive forest and Danura does not understand how this woman knows so much. At that moment, Takatu lays the girl on the bench, 
and the roof of the car goes flying. As for the previous city guard, they are trying to extract information from the henchman who survived the assault. A vampire named Lane takes the lead in the process. She is of the original blood class, the highest rank of undead, and analyzing the eyes of the wounded, she is impressed how the blindness of the dog shows no bruising or injury. Then she removes the criminal's eye and heals him with another. Still, he continues unable to see, so Lane bites the dog, who, by linking to the vampire's bloodline, his physical strength grew monstrously. Nevertheless, the vision has not yet returned, which Lane finds intriguing. At that moment, a knight invades the chamber, and as he could not be seen, George analyzes that that beam belongs to the Bravo class. Back on the train, the announcer warns that a sage is dealing with an aggressor, making Takatu realize that no one is after them. So they head out to see what's happening, and an invading robot is fighting a local protector. Denera asks if Takatu shouldn't erase both since they are in the way. The young man counters with another question. If he should erase everyone who stands in his path, then should he erase everyone who appears in front of him? After all, he has to establish some rules for this ability. Despite his speech, shortly afterward, the two fighters approach the civilians and the sage freezes a bunch of citizens. Meanwhile, the other swordsman reveals himself as Ian and attacks Lane, but the vampire instantly heals every damage she receives. She then questions why Bravo is attacking a sage when he should be facing the demon lord. However, Ayn is determined to wipe out all the sages from the earth with his sacred sword Cartina, causing an explosion in the tower, where everyone was mentioning Ariel's name as he celebrates victory. Back on the train, Takatu asks why the sage attacked them, and Santaru becomes irritated with the insolence since sages should be praised on their knees instead of questioned in this way. He even calls Takatu a monstrosity. In response, Takatu finds a reason to erase the sage. In the meantime, the aggressor robot approaches and says it has no intention of fighting. In front of Ayn, the vampire asks if Ariel is his lover. Bravo doesn't understand how she survived that, and she replies that she didn't survive, but not even death can hold her, unfortunately. Thus, even after Ayn surrenders his life, she decides to spare him but throws Ayn down the tower and orders her subordinates to track Yajuri Takatu. The young man is talking to the robot, who notes his ability so it's willing to give anything it can in exchange for avoiding conflict. Takatu asks if the robot knows any way to return to their world, but the aggressor only knows the way back to its own world and can't take Takatu along because, besides not being physically present in this space, it also couldn't bring someone so dangerous to its world. With that, Takatu is satisfied with the help, but Mokomoko wanted to ask one more little favor from the outsider before he leaves. Hours later, George and Edelbard find Santaru's body and inform their leader. With images of the incident, Lane suspects that Yajuri Takatu has the instant death ability, but Cheyenne recalls that Santaru was resistant to that technique, so she instructs her subordinate to investigate if Takatu has any connection to the darkness. Then she sends one of her subordinates, Masayuki, to lead the immortal army to Hanabusa, even if it causes the destruction of that city. Meanwhile, the protagonists decide to leave on their own since they didn't want to be seen with an aggressor, and Mokomoko presents Denuro with a sword made from pieces disguised in the girl's clothing, leaving Tomachika wondering how to use a sci-fi weapon that works this way. After their journey, they arrive in the city of Hanabusa, according to Denura, a typical Japanese town. She asks Takatu if he wouldn't like some time to develop his skills, but he replies that he was practicing with some bandits and beasts that were chasing them along the way. When the girl looks back, she sees a pile of bodies behind them. Denera tells him to warn her when there's an enemy behind her because walking unaware is dangerous. The guy just affirms that he knows that very well. Later, she comments that since he gets tired after using his powers, maybe he can only use them a few times a day. Contrary to that, Takatu reveals that it's the fact that he gets tired that allows him to keep using them, making the girl realize that this young man's prowess knows no bounds. Entering the city, Mokomoko notes that instead of protecting themselves with walls, they seem to have set up a magical barrier. Until they reach a tall hotel, the one Celestina mentioned they would find. The group decides to use the hotel as a base and Denera rushes in, excited about the size of the place. Once inside, everyone sees that the place is truly fancy and a classmate named Yuki Takabana approaches the girl in the group, expressing happiness that she is safe. Denera asks what he's doing there and he replies that he doesn't have to stay with people who level up inefficiently. Beside him, a girl named Erika asks who the girl he's talking to is, displaying basic jealousy for everyone to see. But Takibana clarifies that they are just classmates, so there's nothing to it. On the other side, another girl praises her master for having such a kind heart even when dealing with rude people. Meanwhile, Danara asks who these strange people are, and since Takatu knows as much as she does, Takibana introduces his hand-picked bodyguards. The blonde is Erika from the fifth class. 
She doesn't care to introduce herself, but as Yugi ordered, she obeys. Next is Stephanie, from the fourth class, who makes it clear she doesn't want to talk to those strange people unless her master orders her to. In the third class, Chelsea introduces herself in the most timid way possible, placing a bear in front of her face to simulate the plush commanding the death of some girl inside her head. Then, Euphemia introduces herself as from the second class. Finding Denura very ugly, she earnestly asks the girl to stay as far away as possible. Last but not least, the captain of the bodyguards introduces herself as Riza. In an excessively serious tone, she asks Denura not to be so arrogant as to think that Tachibana is just a classmate. With the end of this presentation round, Denera asks if the girls can stop being so aggressive for no reason, but Tachibana apologizes, saying he's not very good at being tough with girls. In the end, he asks everyone to be quiet for now. After that, Takadu comments to his friend that this guy was one of the students who stayed behind on the bus, but has no idea how he ended up here with these women behind him. Denera responds that the guy has always been popular among girls and quite cocky, so it seems he's just continuing that. Convinced of his ways, Tachibana soon invites Danura to be another one of his lovers. As the girl reacts negatively, he thinks it's because of Taka too and decides to make an exception for a man in the group so both could be his slaves. Danura was trying to understand if the guy was serious, while Taka too decided not to kill him now, thinking the young man might have some issues in his head. Danura asks why the boy is so arrogant, and Tachibana explains that he is from the Dominator class, a class with the ability to enslave lower-level individuals. But Denura implies that he must be way behind the level of the rest of the student group since they are busy with missions, while he's out there playing, Simon says. With that, Takibana thinks Denura is already so in love that she wants to know everything about his life. So the Dominator reveals that there was a party to celebrate the success of the first mission in the city where he was. He was drinking at a table alone during the celebration when a classmate named Haruto Otori asked for permission and sat with him. As a member of the consultant class, Otori advises Tachibana to enslave first-level servants and make them level up. As they defeat new people, those defeated will also be enslaved and much of that experience will pass to both of them. Since Tachibana didn't know he could do that, Utori explains that one of his abilities as a consultant is to know various hidden powers that people are unaware of. Finally, Utori says he's giving this advice because Tachibana is promising. And as the Dominator class is rarer, it would be foolish not to rely on a sage with such talent. With that, he bids farewell and wishes good luck to his colleague. With this story, the Dominator justifies why he's evolving without lifting a finger. He levels up by enslaving people who do the dirty work for him. And telling this story, he asks Denura once again if she would like to join his group, and the girl feels even more motivated to decline the invitation. So Takabana asks the girl to just think about it and leaves. Takatu comments that Denura would probably be safer with that guy than with him, but the girl shows with her face that this opinion was quite unnecessary. Meanwhile, Lane is seeking to confront the darkness, and when she comes across it, the vampire asserts with conviction that this creature stands no chance against her. Back at the hotel, Denura wonders how long they will stay in that hotel, as it's been three days since they arrived. So she asks Mokomoko to go into his room and see what's going on, but the ghost won't enter that room even if they pay her, and she has no idea how the guy will react to such a sudden invasion. Then, Denura sees the city upside down below her because a servant named Masayuki had finally arrived wreaking havoc. With the immortal body beside him, any citizen run over by them would be turned into a third-class zombie. Inside the hotel, Mokomoko notices that the people there are not good at all because they have the smell of death. As they witness the rapid decline of the city's population, another ghost approaches their door. Instead of Denura wanting to go down to see what's happening, she lies on the comfortable bed in that luxury room and ignores everything. Mokomoko disapproves of the young woman's attitude, saying she can't just pretend the city is falling apart. Moreover, there's a hostile presence nearby spying on them, so it's wise to stay alert. Fearing that the situation might be more serious than she imagines, Denura tries to call Takatu, but the boy is fast asleep, dreaming of a Mona from his childhood. He's awakened by a female voice calling his name, while his dog Mikori licks the boy's face. He gets up, sees a girl inviting him for breakfast, but as soon as he says he's coming, Takatu is awakened by the phone and called to action. As soon as he steps out of the room, he senses a strange presence around, although he doesn't see anything. Therefore, he focuses his vision and detects a ghostly figure in the corner of the corridor. Immediately, he eliminates Erika, Tachibana's bodyguard. Then he reaches Denura and warns her of a hostile ghost behind her. At the same time, Tachibana is away inspecting the mission, but realizes that his servant's signal has disappeared. Moreover, a creature invades the area where they were. Back to the protagonist, Denura recognizes the blonde as Erika and Takatu knows this will be a big problem with her master. Therefore, they have to get out of there as quickly as possible. 
Denera mentions that she needs to gather her things first, and as she acts like she's just going out to buy bread, Takatu asks about the reason for her calmness. She replies that she's used to this kind of pressure, but when Mokomoko says that the Denura family doesn't give up easily, the young woman admits she's not as evolved as her ancestors. As for Tachibana, the giant insect attacking him proves to be no considerable challenge, visibly frustrating the Dominator who was expecting something more dangerous. He repels the monster with his protective barrier and after tearing off his arms, Stephanie praises the fact that not even level 100 monsters can defeat her master. The monster is still alive and asks who this strong man is, but ignoring the enemy, Takabana launches a flare bomb at the insect and enslaves it after the victory. Next, the new servant is healed and informs his master that these runes go up to level 150, as he was asked. So the master orders the insect to recruit new servants in the lower levels. With that decided, Takabana returns to Erika, and seeing on the servant's camera that she fell in the corridor out of nowhere and lost the signal, he is confused about the reason for this. Ufumia supposes that Erika was trying to please the boss by bringing that Danara girl he wanted or just wanted to eliminate the girl due to the earlier disagreement. For this reason, the master orders Riza and Chelsea to go after Danara as she might have killed Erika. Far away, Elaine seems to be having more trouble with the darkness than she thought. By striking the enemy's forehead, she knows that her high-speed revivification is much faster than the collapse of the darkness, but it seems that it's not causing any damage. Meanwhile, Takatu and Danura try to escape, but Riza appears in the corridor and freezes the two protagonists, hoping to take the girl to her master. However, Takatu destroys the ice as if it's nothing since he just learned that he can eliminate ice as if it were an individual. Obviously, this leaves the captain embarrassed with how easily the prisoner freed himself from his attack. For this reason, she tries to increase the difficulty level and prepares to use her wand again in the fight. Nevertheless, Takatu simply kills the wand with a simple command. Having done that, Riza realizes that the guy can destroy anything with just a thought, so she puts hostility aside and decides to cooperate with the two. Despite that, the only way she can use her magic is through her wand, so she takes out the last one she had on hand. Since she took the item from a delicate place, Danura is worried that Takatu is too focused on the scene, but he's just impressed with the fact that Riza can hide a wand in such a way. Then Takatu orders the captain to reveal her intentions, and she confesses that more people are coming after Danura besides her. The first evidence of this appears at that moment when a shadow tries to attack the girl, but her ancestral spirit from the Danura family manifests at the right moment to counter the hostility. But after the counterattack, the group realizes that it was just a doll and several identical ones were behind them. With that, Riza takes advantage of her companion's help and positions herself again for battle, but Takatu eliminates the problem on the spot. Nearby, Chelsea orders her dolls to beat that woman to death, but as they advance, Takatu eliminates them one by one. Chelsea feels what happened and mourns for her beloved dolls. Then the protagonists reach the staircase where she was hiding and the girl resorts to tears, begging the two to stop their wickedness. They look at her with their usual skeptical expressions, but since Chelsea is surrendered, they get the information they need about her master. Observing the scene with spy insects, Tachibana learns that Riza died and Chelsea is out of action. Also, Takatu destroys anything he wants with his thoughts. Therefore, he decides to take the targets to a more easily observable place while attacking. As for the protagonists, they try to escape, but hundreds of cockatiels on the staircase are driving Denora crazy. Mokomoko knows that Tachibana is using these insects to monitor their group. Thus, Denora asks Takatu to kill them all, but the young man reminds her that these birds will fall on her head if that happens. So Danara decides to change her mind. But then Takatu remembers that these cockatiels cannot be left alive because they are capable of killing a human, for example, by entering a person's mouth in large numbers and suffocating them. Imagining this happening to her, Danara curses the entire bloodline of the despicable Yuki Tachibana. Mokomoko reminds the two that in this rhythm, the entire city is going to turn into zombies, so wisely they decided to continue with their plans. Since they didn't kill the insects, Takabana thought that the presence of the bugs was hindering the boy's power, so he decides to attack to solve the problem. He orders the cockatiels themselves to attack. The insects light up in red and seem increasingly hostile, so Takatu decides to try a technique at that moment. If everything goes as he imagined, it won't be a problem to kill Takabana right now. He focuses on a kind of magical portal that takes his thoughts to the target, and even though he's far from him, Takatu manages to bring down his enemy. However, since the cockatiels were still standing, the protagonist imagines that the master's death has freed the insects from prison. This news terrifies Denura, who thinks that this will make those disgusting creatures even more unpredictable. Denura asks the guy to wipe them all out, but Takatu asks if it's fair to kill a creature just because we think they are unpleasant. And with that life lesson, the two leave the place. 
Returning to the Dominator Master, Stephanie tries to bring him back with her healing magic, but absolutely nothing works. Euphemia announces that she's leaving since she's now free from the slavery power, but the fourth-class bodyguard doesn't seem to share that idea, so she decides to stay with her master. Leaving the hiding place, Euphemia comes across the fight between Lane and the Darkness. Soon, she warns the vampire that she has no chance against such a force, and since she doesn't know how to deal with that enemy, she decides to listen to the woman. With that, she enchants Euphemia and bites her, making her her servant to extract everything she knows. Meanwhile, Takatu and Danura descend to the city and discover that practically the entire population of Hanabusa has been turned into undead and Masayuki declares the start of the zombie epidemic hunting humans. Already Lane, the immortal vampire, has Euphemia under control after the kiss, and she begins to tell her new follower about her intention to test the abilities of Yajuri Takatu. Since Lane has an absurd restoration ability, she feels confident in finding out whether Takatu can eliminate her or not. The protagonist reaches the midst of the chaos that the city has become, but he believes they can pass through without major issues if they are cautious, considering that these zombies are quite slow. Danara expresses her desire to try to save the people suffering from this epidemic, but both Takatu and Mokomoko think they don't have the ability to help in such a situation, so their plan is just to navigate through the confusion. Meanwhile, Masayuki is being pressured by one of Lane's assistants, the city mayor named Ryuta Takahashi, who claims that Lane left the city of Hanabusa in his hands. However, the commander of the immortal corpse also claims to be under the orders of the vampire, who commanded him to take control of the city. Without resistance, the mayor hands over the key to him, and the commander announces to the entire population that they are after Yajuri Takatu and Tomachika Danura. Therefore, all citizens must gather in the central square within an hour, dead or alive. If this doesn't happen, the zombies will resume chasing the entire population with full force. There's no use trying to escape because the barriers around the city are locked. In other words, either they hand over Takatu with his friend or everyone will turn into zombies. Watching the broadcast, the mayor enters the radio booth and gets upset because Masayuki threatened everyone, but the commander argues that just asking wouldn't have the desired effect, so he needed to provide an incentive to get what he needs. Therefore, Ryuta becomes extremely nervous with the leader of the zombies as he fought hard to elevate the status of the city only to see everything ruined like this. From that point on, Hanabusa becomes a pandemonium of witch hunting, with the entire population arming themselves to find the two fugitives from Masayuki. Hiding in the alleys, Danara can no longer say whether the zombies are more dangerous than these crazed people, while Takatu reflects that they are probably being pursued because they killed that arrogant sage the other day, so he concludes that indiscriminate killing has its disadvantages. Soon, some residents approach the protagonist duo, and as the first one advances, Takatu quickly knocks the man down, making the rest reconsider their actions and flee immediately. Reflecting on what happened, Danara and Takatu start to worry because even the citizens are becoming aggressive, suspecting that Masayuki intentionally turned the residents against them, thinking that the two wouldn't eliminate ordinary people. Therefore, maybe it's better to voluntarily appear in the central square to negotiate a more peaceful resolution to this conflict. So they traverse a Hanabusa curse by chaos until they manage to find the leader of the zombies and Masayuki finds this the most anticlimactic way to surrender, as he was expecting a more exciting pursuit. Therefore, he starts taunting the two humans, who are just trying to negotiate their departure via train to the real capital, so they need the barriers removed to reach the station. But the fact that Takatu is requesting this without any nervousness infuriates the zombie leader, so his veins pop out and he shouts that the two humans are not in a position to demand anything at the moment. Therefore, Takatu thinks it might be fair to give something in return for this favor and offers to let Masayuki live even though he's a jerk. This is the cue for the undead boss to completely lose it, ordering the immortal corpse to massacre that arrogant human since this Takatu cannot kill those who are already dead. But that's not exactly how things go down, and the protagonist eliminates all the enemies instantly. Witnessing this, the city mayor raises his hands and tries to distance himself, saying he has nothing to do with this zombie invasion. Meanwhile, Masayuki is upset with his dead allies dying again, asking Takatu how he can do this. Takatu has no idea how it's possible, but in his mind, those enemies were kind of alive since they could move. Either way, he decides who is alive or dead. And since those dead were moving, they were alive in the end. With that, Masayuki shouts Lane's name, asking if that vampire knew that this human was capable of doing this. To counter the attack, Masayuki starts transforming into a bizarre zombie bat until Takatu extinguishes him without ceremony. Danara feels sorry that the boy didn't wait for Masayuki to transform, but he wasn't in the mood for that. After that, the girl asks what they will do about the barriers since the zombie leader was dead, but fortunately, the city mayor was there and could be useful. 
He explains that it was Sage Lane who sent the Immortal Corp after them, and the duo is surprised having another Sage besides Cheyenne and moreover, wanting to capture both of them. Speaking of which, Mokomoko warns that spiritual energy with the intent to kill is being manipulated in the direction of this city, so it seems that these enemy forces are not sparing any effort to stop Denura and Taka too. In addition, this magical energy seems to move the citizens of Hanabusa themselves this time. For this reason, Mayor Ryota tries to intervene in the situation because he can't stand so much chaos in his city anymore, so he takes Hanabusa's key and tries to activate some kind of device. However, the key does not respond. For this reason, Ryota suspects that Lane herself is personally manipulating the barrier. And in the meantime, the suspicions are confirmed when Lane herself is concerned that this strategy is very dangerous because the interference of Yuki Tachibana was identified from a distance by Takatu, and he managed to eliminate the target from countless kilometers away. And because of this concern, Lane asks Euphemia the degree of danger she thinks Yagari Takatu represents. Tachibana's former bodyguard presumes that this guy may be above a sage, a swordsman, or even a mythical being, so it would be prudent not to mess with such an individual. Lane feels secure in her potential, but that doesn't mean she's reckless enough to underestimate a power like Takatu's. Regardless, she has no choice but to continue her mission. Meanwhile, the cursed population of Hanabusa surrounds the protagonists and Denora asks if Takatu can identify the source of this manipulation to destroy the threat. However, he explains that it probably doesn't apply to this case as Tachibana was connected to the servants themselves, making it easier to identify the source of energy for that reason. At that moment, several enemies attack and are neutralized by Takatu. While they contemplate a way out of the situation, Mayor Ryuta Takahashi seems extremely distressed at witnessing so many ordinary citizens of Hanabusa dying right in front of him in this manner. Lane begins to move more pieces on the chessboard by provoking the arrival of darkness in the city where her enemy is trapped. Additionally, she projects several clones of her body making Takatu feel the multiplication of hostile energy even from a distance. At that moment, darkness invades Hanabusa and disintegrates every building in its path. Lane's clones are waiting for the signal from the master to attack if anything deviates from the expected. Observing that horrifying creature, Denera asks his friend if he can do something about it. However, despite Takatu feeling that he can help, he has a bad feeling. Nevertheless, he can't simply leave things as they are, so he applies his instant death technique to darkness. Even though it is eliminated, a strange charge is seen reacting in the creature's body, causing a meteor shower over the city. Takatu doesn't know what it is, but he presumes that some malevolent force has allied with Darkness's thirst for revenge and is causing this attack, perhaps wanting to annihilate the entire city or observing his capabilities. However, upon closer inspection, Denura identifies that the comets falling from the sky are several women in red, descending in hordes towards the ground. The mayor alerts that it is indeed Lane involved in this. Despite that, since she is not personally on the offensive, she cannot be the direct target of Takatu's automatic counterattack, as he well remembers. Moreover, they are so fast in their descent that the boy may not react in time if a clone falls on him. So, Ryuta tries to cooperate with his broader view of the city, having access to exclusive technologies as the mayor. He informs that these aerial attacks have a pattern, not hitting the same place twice, and consecutive attacks are not made near each other. Mokomoko comments that even though Lane seems to be doing something random, she knows exactly what she is doing. With this information, the mayor deduces where the attacks will be in a short time and takes Takatu to the designated location via teleportation, another exclusive technology of the mayor. Upon arrival, within seconds, one of the vampire's replicas is about to hit the field. Takatu kills the target while Mokomoko envelops the humans in a shield to protect them from the impact. After the dust settles, Mokomoko explains that she had acquired a Furumaru from darkness not long ago, and it is a flexible, magical object that can become a protective barrier or even armor. Thus, the other copies of Lane begin to catch fire, and the original sage wonders how immortal vampires can be killed. But she knew that if the first clone died, the same would happen to all the others since they were made from the same mold. However, that doesn't mean there isn't another solution. Therefore, Lane tries to create other replicas using a slightly different configuration from the previous one to bypass this logic. Despite this, before she could perform her trick, the vampire realizes that her original body is dead in another dimension, so she falls lifeless while catching fire. At that moment, a child awakens in her coffin and receives a message from Lane, informing that her plan worked because even though she is dead, the child survived. Then, she decides to reveal the true identity of the little girl, saying that she is Lane herself, but in a separate body that inherited no memories from the vampire to avoid Yajuri Takatu's attacks. After that, all the chaos in Hanabusa had finally come to an end, and Mayor Ryuta Takahashi thanks the two protagonists for their help. 
Ganora is pleased with the recognition, but asks if the fact that they had dealt with that sage a few days ago will cause any problems for them. However, Ryuta is calm and responds that he didn't have much respect for that unbearable figure. Thus, he grants a vehicle for them to continue their mission to the royal capital. When Denura gets in the car and asks when Takatu will take the wheel, he replies that he always crashes the car and absolutely every turn in the racing games he usually plays, so probably him driving is not a good idea. With that, Denura thinks it's better to take the wheel, leaving Mokomoko excited, saying how happy she is to see the Denura family's great skill in driving and practice. However, Tomochika is already tired of the coast putting the family name on everything they do, as if it were a natural talent for everything in life. Later, a samurai named Ryuko Minomiya beheads a creature threatening her group, earning immediate admiration from the rest of the accompanying swordsmen. Subsequently, they all return to the camp where they are housed and Ryuko encounters the ninja Carol, who was invading her tent. Carol admits that she was trying to take the samurai's phone in an attempt to see Takatu's monitoring tool, but unfortunately couldn't. Surprised by the audacity and talent of the girl in being able to enter unnoticed, the samurai asks Carol what kind of class she is and the girl explains that she is an unusual type of American ninja. Ryuko asks if she is without any monitoring system since she was looking for hers, so Carol Slane explains that they were preparing an exclusive satellite to observe Takatu, but this device has no use in this world. Then an alarm goes off on the samurai's phone warning that the first Alpha Omega gate has been opened. In the middle of the road, the protagonists are navigating through an extremely perilous path and Denura begins to realize by the twists and turns that it would be better for Takatu to be the one really driving, but only God can wake this boy up from another deep slumber. Ahead of the driver, a giant rock appears that cannot be avoided. At that moment, the guy goes back to dreaming about scenes from his childhood. His stepmother asks if he likes the name Yajri Takatu, then teaches the boy how to introduce himself to others, leaving the boy excited about the affection he is receiving. In this same dream, we see Asaka Takatu in a final exam, signing a work agreement that basically boils down to not complaining even if you die on duty. On the other side of the table, a man named Yukio Shireishi agrees with the woman's observation about the contract. Just as she was about to bail out of this situation, Yukio pulls her back and convinces the girl to sign. Shortly afterward, she asks if she is being taken to a secret base of an evil organization, but he explains to Asaka that it is just a reputable institution conducting experiments. Asaka becomes curious about her role in that place and Yukio explains that, in short, she will have to take care of the monster, as they are still conducting malicious experiments in this Life Forms Research Institute. Asaka was already terrified by this talk, but the panic only increases when she faces a giant and dark corridor. The scientist explains that this is a sacred text, a comfort for ordinary people. They reach another elevator towards the woman's workplace, where Yukio explains that the term Alpha Omega is the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet, and it means everything, or eternity. This is the code name of the test subject she will take care of. Asaka asks if it is a human, but since the scientist has never had contact with the subject, he cannot say for sure. The only thing he can convey is that Alpha Omega can kill anything at once. Hearing that absurdity, the woman asks if that's what they want her to deal with, but Yukio argues that she has a teacher's license, and that should be enough. Furthermore, there is the possibility of humanity being extinct if this experiment is not conducted correctly. With proper education, they might be able to prevent that. The girl says there are many more qualified people for such a matter. But despite that, Yukia responds that there were applications for this job and Asaka is the perfect candidate. Additionally, the scientist cannot provide any more information. And if Asaka needs to know anything, it will be written in the instructions. So he bids farewell and wishes her good luck, leaving her alone with the titanium valve that she opens with her new badge, while she curses that if humanity ends, it won't be her fault. Crossing the entrance, she enters a strange world and using a map drawn in the instructions, she manages to reach her workplace, where she looks for someone who can receive her. Eventually, she opens one of the doors and comes face to face with a young boy. At first, she is indignant with a child trapped inside and throws him out of the house, telling the boy to play with some river crab. However, he eliminates a creature that was after the woman and the boy explains that she arrived there hiding behind her own shadow, and this type of demon usually appears to try to kill him. Next, he explains that he doesn't mind playing but asks if it can be tomorrow as it is getting dark. Asaka comes to her senses and remembers to introduce herself appropriately. As soon as she says her name to the boy, he replies that he is called Alpha Omega. The woman explains that this is just a code name for him, so he adds that he used to be called Mr. Okakushi before being taken to this place. After that, Asaka prepares instant noodles for the child, and as he eats, he is amazed by the taste. Soon, the tutor asks if his mother called him by any name. 
But as the boy has no idea what a mother means, she decides to make up a name. Looking directly at his face, she envisions a puppy in her head that makes her decide on the name Yojuri. Therefore, Yojuri repeats his name and adds the woman's last name, Takatu, as he heard that's what people do, putting the family name after the first name, and since he didn't have one, he wanted to borrow hers. So she agrees to let the boy use her family name and teaches the little one to introduce himself properly to others, earning a genuine smile from the child. At this moment, Yojuri wakes up in the car while replying to Asaka that it was also a pleasure to meet her. Seeing an opportunity to fully wake him up, Ganora shakes him and alerts that they are in a dead end. She takes the chance to mock the fact that Takatu slept so well in the midst of this madness, but he says that he used a lot of his ability in Hanabusa, and that left him very tired. Later, he asks why they need to go to the royal capital, which annoys Danura for him, only asking that at this point. Takatu explains that their goal is to talk to Siam the Sage and that this might take them back to the real world. And since that's the goal, maybe they don't even need to go through the royal capital. But Danura reminds him that all their classmates are going there, so she puts the car in reverse to try to go around the rock. However, they end up hitting a dragon on the way and of course, Yojuri ends its life instantly, but this time dozens of other dragons were flying towards them, thirsty for blood and spitting fire. Despite all this fury, Takatu wipes out all enemies at once making Danura comment that the scene looks like a bug spray commercial. But the danger was far from over because shortly after, a golden thunder dragon appears in front of them. However, Takatu does not detect any signs of hostility in this monster and despite its threatening appearance, the dragon only says that they pass the test and flies away. They try to call the dragon back as it can communicate with humans, but the winged creature does not listen. For this reason, Takatu shouts that if the dragon doesn't come back, it will have the same fate as the others, and with that, the creature freezes in the air instantly, making Denaro wonder how this creature can fly without flapping its wings. So back to the protagonists, the dragon reveals its original form as a little girl justifying that she wanted the test if they were qualified to see the Swordmaster incredible being capable of granting the gift to those who deserve it. However, Takatu responds that he has nothing to do with that, as he just wants to reach the royal capital, leaving the dragon embarrassed for having taken the Swordmaster for granted. Thus, the little girl pleads with them to go see the master since he asked her to recruit some new candidates, and he rivals a sage. So Takatu realizes that suddenly they could find out something about returning to the original world by talking to this Swordmaster, but Danara thinks it wouldn't be good for them to change course since they are already lost enough. Hearing this, the dragon offers to show them the way to the royal capital as long as they visit the master first and finally introduces herself as Attila and jumps into the car even before any response. After the journey, they arrive at a place where several swordsmen are trying to become the next sword master, and today they are deciding who will be the next knight of the Divine King. One of the candidates praises the fact that the intruders managed to get there but warns that they are already disqualified. However, at this moment, Yurei, the sword master, appears, retorting that no test has started yet, so there's no reason to disqualify anyone. After this scolding, Yurei orders everyone to start battling until he says stop making Danura rethink the image she had of this old man. Yurei adds that if more than half of the swordsmen haven't died in 10 minutes, everyone will be disqualified. Takatu raises his hand and says he doesn't mind being disqualified and asks if he can leave. However, Yurei seems dissatisfied and creates a new rule for the test, stipulating that if anyone leaves, everyone will fail. So the master orders the competition to begin and all the candidates start fighting. A body falls in front of Danura, which scares the girl, so Mokomoko comments that the girl has seen worse than that to be scared by this scene, and Tomachika responds that it takes a bit more than that to make her scream. Then some men try to attack Takatu, but at the same moment, a warrior arrives to protect him, shouting to the four winds that he knows the sword master's intention with this test, which is to know who among them has the ability to act like a knight of the divine wood. But besides that, Takatu identifies some wizards with the intention of killing hidden in the bushes, so he eliminates all of them. As the enemy suddenly fell, the warrior interpreted that the sword master had punished those insolent troublemakers, relieving Denura from having to explain how it really happened. After the slaughter, the handsome warrior has the brilliant idea of asking Denura to take a walk with him. At the moment, another injured swordsman begs them to give him the rainbow stone. In fact, it was an apology stone, and it completely regenerates the boy. Yurei orders the survivors to follow him while Attila begs the protagonist to participate in the trial because if he becomes a knight of the Divine King, she could become his follower. Since they haven't gathered any relevant information yet, Takatu and Denura decide to follow the group. So the gallant warrior introduces himself as Rick, and Denura asks why he speaks as if he were some kind of celebrity. Later, the Shire guy says his name is Linnell, and explains that he's only there by invitation from a friend. 
Takatu asks who the Divine King is, and Rick says that he deals with the gods who were sealed, called demons. A thousand years ago, the Dark God was sealed by the hands of the Divine King himself. However, this evil being is still a threat even when sealed as his descendants are active behind the scenes throughout the country. Denera asks Lanel what stone he used, and the boy says he received them as an apology, and that they can heal serious injuries. Denera is impressed that someone gave such an artifact to the boy just as an apology, so Lenel explains that he has always been very unlucky, and that on a day when he was sacrificed by a criminal organization, when he thought it would be the end of everything, a goddess appeared and gave him an apology stone. Denera comments that she still doesn't understand the connection between things, so she asks Mokomoko if the gods can really influence people's destinies, and the ghost explains that, yes, not everyone is protected by guardian spirits like young Denera. In the meantime, Rick asks what Gaksha is, and Lenel explains that it's a game where he has a chance with three stones, and with 30 stones, he has 10 consecutive chances. As a demonstration, he throws the stones into the air and receives an old cleaning brush in his hands and boasts that this is how he exchanges magic stones for random items. Danera thinks this is a terrible deal while questioning the boy if he's not afraid of running out of stones. Lionel elucidates that he gets new apology stones at midnight every day, depending on the amount of misfortune that happened that day. Finally, the group crosses a magical barrier that takes them to a place with a giant tower. Mokomoko warns that they need to leave as soon as possible because a very unpleasant smell is passing through the air and something sinister is about to happen. On their side, Lionel vomits some magical element and Denora asks why she doesn't smell it, so Mokomoko explains that he's protecting her from this evil. However, shortly after, Lionel gains resistance to the stench through another apology stone making Denora comment that his life seems quite easy with these things in his pocket. The group looks around and realizes that Attila has disappeared, but imagining that she could appear at any moment, they decide to continue their journey until they enter an elevator, where the other candidates are with the Sword Master. From the top of the tower, Gurid reveals the end of the world, where at the center of the magical mass stood the Mistress of the Ancient Sword and the Black God, frozen when the Mistress of Sword pierced both. Despite the ceiling, danger still lingers in the air. While Gurid explains, a mage named Frederica interrupts, stating that defeating the enemies will solve this. Lionel mentions that she was the one who invited him there, and the young woman vows to retire Urab and destroy the Black God on her own. To prove herself, she unleashes a solar explosion at the end of the world. However, as the fireball loses speed, Urab explains that time runs differently inside, so it could take centuries for the flame to reach the Black God. Afterwards, the Sword Master announces that the selection of knights begins now, and a subordinate presents the details. She explains that the goal is to go from the roof to the first floor of the tower within 24 hours. A candidate named Teresa asks if it's allowed to jump from the top to the ground, and the subordinate explains that everyone must accumulate 100 points within the tower, so there are tasks to be done inside. Additionally, special participants will be added to the competition. In the meantime, Denner asks if Takatu could win this competition with his power, but the young man appears disturbed by his situation when the mist was very thick. He then whispers a secret in his friend's ear, leaving her furious. With that, Takatu urges Denner to hurry out of this tower, but when it's time to head out on the mission, Fregerica tells Lionel to pass her the magic stone so she can replenish her mana, but the boy reveals they only work for him. So the girl tosses one of the stones on the ground, rumbling that this kid always slows her down. Right at the start of the tower, Rick thanks the kind souls who braved the tower before them because most of the traps had already been triggered, leaving only a few. Unlucky as ever, Lionel activates a spear that pierces his chest, but once again, he cheats death with a stone of apology. Seeing the scene, Denera asks why the boy doesn't carry one of those around since he's always getting into trouble, so he decides to tie one to his hand to avoid kicking the bucket unexpectedly. Fired up by the resolution, Lenel charges into the next challenge only to fall into another trap in the next room. The group enters the room to rescue their companion, and there was Teresa amidst an absurd amount of blood asking Rick not to judge her hastily, despite all the destruction trailing behind her. Rick asks why she's participating in the challenge even though she's already a knight and she explains that she accidentally killed many people, so her credentials were revoked and she was forced to retake the exams. Rick tells the rest of the group to get out of there, but Danera notices that it won't be possible because several thin wires are spread all over the place. Admiring the view of the enemy, Teresa announces it would be a shame if the trash in front of her survived because a knight of the Divine King needs to be truly powerful. But, as Rick aptly points out while shielding himself from the wires with his shield, if strength were the only requirement to be a knight, Teresa wouldn't have been demoted. Observing the discussion, Denera knows that Strange Girl is holding back her true ability and just playing with Rick. 
Then Taka too enters the fray, eliminating the enemy in his usual manner. Then he sees in her hands the Stone of Apology, the same one Lionel uses and looking around, Danora sees the boy pleading for the stone again, lying on the ground without an arm. After that, the group reaches floor 98, where the person in charge of the test informs them it's a safe zone where they can rest. Takatu suggests they all split up since they'll probably have to kill each other at some point. Rick agrees, realizing this exam is crueler than he imagined, and asks if Takatu and Danora will be okay without him. The protagonist assures the warrior he can rest easy, while Lionel can't wait for midnight to earn a few more stones and stay in the game. With that settled, Rick and Lionel book a room each and go to rest, but when the two remaining try to get their accommodations, the examiner states there's only one room left. With no other choice, Takatu and Denura accept, and to top it off, Mokomoko is always present, but she asks them not to mind because she'll always be hidden by the walls. Denura replies that it still seems pretty embarrassing, but Takatu wastes no time and jumps into bed in pajamas, falling asleep instantly. Meanwhile, Lionel is happy he's made it far in this challenge after only dying 15 times. As if the happiness wasn't enough, he just received a hundred stones of apology, plus a free gasha. Soon he rushes to see what he got in this gacha, and tossing the necessary stones into the air, he eagerly awaits whether he'll receive a sinister weapon or an ally character. But instead, the goddess who reincarnated him in this world appears. She says she's coming to take a look around and updated his respawn point to this floor, so every time he dies, they'll respawn there to ensure his nap. Despite this, Lionel thinks this place is too dangerous, but the goddess disappears without answering. In the meantime, the examiner shows concern because the number of deaths doesn't match the number of souls, but Grabe says she doesn't need to worry about that since they probably have enough to maintain the second barrier. The girl agrees, adding that they need to replenish the half-demons for the first barrier. Far away, a girl pursues a candidate sage, saying if the boy refuses her offer this time, she'll have to kill him. Then she uses an ability to identify she's facing Rakuto Sei too. A transmigrant blessed by God with his power. Satan finds it boring to be revealed by magical eyes and asserts he can also know the girl's name if that's all. Then he calls out Aoi Hayanos's name and attacks her with magical tentacles. In response, she uses an ability called Only World, which could be defined as the world that only rewards effort. The tentacles are eliminated, and then Rakuto casts another spell on the girl, who retaliates with the exact same spell, as she's always been able to do. However, the boy isn't convinced of defeat and tries to use the funeral pyre to end the battle, but nothing happens. Hayanos explains that God granted him power without any effort and probably took it back without any effort as well. But the boy says he didn't receive this power from God as he draws his sword. Hayanos assesses that this weapon holds a high value of faith, so it won't be able to destroy the sword, then she eliminates the boy on the spot. After that, the girl receives a message from her dagger, saying her next job is to eliminate her next targets, Yajiri Takatu, and Tomochika Denura. At that moment, the healer Hanakawa arrives in a hurry and kneels before the girl, recounting that he survived a forest full of dangerous monsters because he was rescued by Rikuto. But now that the girl killed him, Hanakawa claims he has no hope left, so he begs to be Oi's servant. On that same morning, Mokomoko wakes Denura up because she needs help getting out of the wall since she can't get out on her own. When she saw Takatu using the girl as a pillow, she tried to disappear because she thought she was getting in the way of something, but soon got curious and tried to follow the scene, which got her stuck in the wall. On top of that, she found out this tower has the power to absorb the souls of the dead to a specific place, and the energy these walls possess prevented her from moving. At this moment, Takatu wakes up, and with Mokomoko's plea for help, he tries to kill the wall's absorption function while the ghost is being sucked in. Then Takatu manages to locate the target point and detaches Mokomoko from the wall. The ghost cries in despair for almost having died, but Danara reminds him that he died a long time ago. With that done, Takatu believes that this tower has the power to absorb souls for some reason far beyond a mere test. Therefore, he instructs his partner to prepare for the rest of the mission and warns that he will destroy any enemy that appears in their path, no discussion. With this, Danara says that she has known the way the boy uses his power from the beginning, and although he is not always reasonable in choosing to use it, she recommends that he be as cautious as possible, besides saying that the way he solves problems would be exactly the same as she would if she had that ability. This realization embarrasses Takatu, so he turns around and says he's hungry, to avoid the subject. Back in Oi Hayanovis, her follower says they should run away from there as soon as possible, because her power is to deny overpowered abilities, so it wouldn't be the case against a dragon like that. Despite this, the girl claims it's much easier than it seems because with her ability only world, she can alter events that appear so they are exactly as she thinks they should be. In the case of the dragon, she thinks a creature of that size can't fly, and as she concludes that the creature falls. 
Hanakawa finds it as overpowered as what she claims to fight against, but Ilwe argues that it would only be if she could also face objects with high faith value, which is not the case. However, the dragon returns and eats the healer's arm, who heals himself and asks if the girl just took away his flying ability. Oi replies yes, so a fair fight is on from now on. Then she cuts off the head of the winged monster, revealing inside it an aggressor named Hedgehog, who flees through the skies at the same moment after absorbing all the information he needed. During the escape, Oi notices a tower in the path where the aggressor was fleeing, so she carries the healer with her to there, who absolutely does not want to meet Takatu again, because he knows the boy will end him as soon as he can. Speaking of him, the protagonist is eliminating all the traps along the way to advance in the challenge until a wizard appears before him complaining that the guy is relying too much on cheating to pass the test. When Danura asks who he is, he reveals that he built this tower and can appear anywhere in it whenever he wants, and then Danura responds that it seems as overpowered as what the two of them are doing. Ignoring her, the mysterious guy complains that he racked his brain to set up all these traps, and someone is passing by destroying everything as if it were nothing. Kakatu says they are just trying to get out of that place, but the man replies that it's not possible, because that tower was built to keep the dark gods sealed. In turn, the protagonist says he won't do anything to that place if he can leave, but the tower's builder considers the possibility that those two are some trick of the dark god. So he introduces himself as Iglesia, known as the High Sorcerer, but before he could finish his speech, Takatu knocks him out. Danura goes crazy because this guy seemed important to die so quickly, but her friend says the guy would probably try to kill him. Meanwhile, the Swordmaster's assistant announces one problem after another, and he gets more and more annoyed. The woman announces another 100 points for Rick, fighter number 97. Next, the warrior meets Frederica, who is helping her friend Linnell accumulate some points since poor guy hasn't won anything so far. Eric praises the progress of his colleague, who thanks God he got a great equipment in the last gasha he did. Somewhere else in the tower, two swordswomen fight each other, while Lord Masaki warns the girl named Shiro that she's losing, and that the enemy's blows aren't even that strong, so Shiro can win this duel. Motivated, the rabbit girl advances against her opponent and strikes a monstrous blow that opens a hole in the ground. Thus, Mokomoko comments that these two duelists seem very strong and therefore wants to know what Takatu is going to do about it. In turn, the protagonist has nothing to do with that brawl, and just wanted to cross the arena without trouble. Looking around, Danara sees that the only way out is behind that guy sitting on the throne who keeps insisting for Shiro's rival to reveal her disguise once and for all. As it had already been discovered, the woman decides to show who she really is, a half-demon named Theodija. She intends to end this fight before the Swordmaster finds out her real identity, so she casts a spell on Shiro, who manages to dodge by dropping her sword, as she is much faster without a weapon and responds with several punches in succession. Seeing that it will take a while, Takatu asks if the guy on the throne wouldn't let them pass there smoothly, while Danara tells the boy to look around and realize that two people are fighting to the death there. With that, Masaki replies that he won't let the two pass as some of his disciples don't have enough points, but Takatu argues that he and Danara have only six accumulated points, so they are small fish. Furious, the lord of the arena affirms that's why they need to fight more, because he values this exam as a game and doesn't respect that they don't see this situation the same way. The half-demon Theodizia tells the protagonist that she's out of it because she has enough points. Therefore, Masaki announces a three-on-three -three fight, where Takatu, Danura, and Theodizia must face the rabbit girl, Shiro, as well as the big girl, Geralda, and the short one, Ima. Theodizia says she doesn't see any chance of winning if the other two opponents are as strong as Shiro, and the lord of the arena makes a point of commenting that the rabbit girl is the weakest of the three, while Ima is a swordswoman and Geralda is a magic specialist. By the way, the Lord intends to take the Half-Demon and Danura for himself, so they must be left alive. Danura asks if Takatu should only kill Masaki in this situation, but instead he kills the three rivals. Thus, he proceeds his way to the exit, and when the Lord tries to stop him because of his hatred, he is eliminated in the same way. Staying Takatu's power, Theodizia asks for the boy's help. She wishes that both of them help her find her missing sister because she heard that her people were trapped in this place. However, helping Theodizia might seem bad in the eyes of the Sword Master, as it may violate the exam rules. Still, Takatu is already in deep trouble, so he doesn't mind getting a bit dirtier. Thus, the Swordswoman explains that her companions are probably underground and somehow, she can sense their presence. At this moment, the rest of the group comes across Takatu and Danura. Moments later, the group reaches the hall from where they came. The Sword Master observes that 17 competitors have made it to the end and declares them all Knights of the Divine King. But at this moment, his assistant alerts Ureb that the tower has fallen silent, making it difficult to maintain the first barrier, and the second one is unstable. 
In other words, the god could break the protection at any moment. And as soon as the girl finishes saying that the first barrier is destroyed, while the second one proves to be quite vulnerable. At this moment, a winged being descends from the heavens, thinking that destroying the tower would make the barrier disappear. Uraim thought all of this would happen in three days, but duty calls now. Therefore, he summons the Knights of the Divine King for their first mission. They must defeat the winged creature or humanity will be lost. In the confusion, Takatu takes the opportunity to search the underground, but Danura is upset because the boy simply doesn't want to do anything against that. The young man explains that dealing with that flying monster will attract too much attention from the Sword Master, so it's better to leave it to others and remain discreet. Meanwhile, Lionel, Rick, and Frederica stand firm in their duty, and the enemy asks how he can break the barrier. If Rureb gives the answer, he will be spared. On the other hand, the Sword Master mocks the fact that the monster is asking this after destroying the entire tower. Thus, the winged man eliminates a knight with just a hand gesture and claims he will do the same with each one until he gets what he wants. Soon, four warriors have been annihilated, until one of them tries to react with several clones, but all are erased with the same ease. Then, Frederica says she can defeat the enemy even without the barrier and gathering all her power, she invokes the extremely compressed light explosion, which the opponent absorbs as if swatting a mosquito with his hand. Behind the winged man, a unique entity emerges saying that this power was quite formidable for a human, and he would have been burned if the spell had hit the target. Worried about being called by these strange names instead of his own name, the entity introduces himself as Loot, while the flyer is called Orgain. However, the mage is not interested in trivial introductions at this moment, so she advances against the entity, who also absorbs her magic, warning the girl that she is not at the level needed to face both of them. Moreover, he turns Frederica's right arm into candy and begins to eat it in front of her. Rit tries to prevent the humiliation and attacks the child, and with the speed and strength of the blow, she realizes that perhaps this warrior has a better chance than the mage. And just as Rick tries to hit loot, Lionel takes care of his friend and soon receives a message that he secure another gacha. So he tries his luck and uses all of his apology stones, thus summoning Vahanado, the goddess who brought Lionel to this world. Thus, she states that she will resolve everything in the blink of an eye. And approaching the dew of entities, Organ bows and is surprised to see the goddess in this situation, and Loot hugs her because of the time they spent apart. Seeing the scene, Lenel asks what the heck is happening, so Vahanado explains that, in fact, meeting her again will be the worst thing that happened in the boy's life because when she talked about resolving things, she meant that exterminating the human race is the solution to the problem. In the meantime, Takatu and his companions seem to be walking in an infinite loop and Mokomoko thinks this is due to a barrier interfering in the empty space. The boy believes that maybe it's an important installation ahead, and that's why it's difficult to reach. The half-demon feels the magical power of her friends more intensely. And at that moment, a bizarre scream is heard, and the barrier disappears, saving the protagonist the trouble, and now they have a clear path to descend. But before continuing the walk, Denura feels a monster with a blade passing through her body until Theodisia opens a door just below and finds several bodies in separate tanks. Looking closely, she presumes that her companions are inside, and even if she hasn't seen her sister thrown into one of these tanks, she feels that the worst may have happened to her too. Takatu believes that these bodies were stored there so that the magical abilities of these beings could be extracted. For this reason, Theodizia draws her sword and ends the suffering of her people. After that, she recalls her tradition, where revenge must always be fulfilled, and thus, she wishes to kill the sword master with her own hands. Speaking of him, Yurev notices that the situation is getting darker, and keeping that in mind, he appoints Rick as the sword master for now. The boy looks back as if he didn't understand, and the old man explains that this is the best choice at the moment because if Yurev dies, Rick will automatically become the sword master. Then, using the power stored in the tower, the young man will be able to fight. After that, Lenel kneels and asks for forgiveness for increasing this problem, and Yurev responds coldly that he never expected anything from that boy from the beginning. Swallowing the harsh words, Lionel remembers that if he dies, he will return to the last safe point, so he tries to have a friendly chat with the goddess who always granted the apology stones to him. He innocently questions why she is talking to the enemy, and she wonders if she should tell the boy or not. Soon, she remembers that she has always had a good relationship with Lionel, and that's why she couldn't let him die curious, especially without knowing why. During this idle conversation, Rick realizes that his friend is trying to buy some time for them. So then Ahada reveals that her beloved Alba Garma left and never returned, while Yurab informs that it's the feared and hated god of darkness, whose name no one dares to utter. The goddess recounts that she spread messengers around the world to find her beloved and one day discovered that he was sealed in this tower. But that's not even the worst part, as no matter what she sends, 
She could never defeat the Sword Master, so she thought about sending someone extremely unlucky like Lionel to force the return of her lost love. Faced with this, Lionel acknowledges the fact of not being the luckiest but didn't expect all this misfortune to bring about the end of humanity as a side effect. Meanwhile, Loot warns the goddess that the barrier is almost disappearing and questions whether they should wait until it happens. So Vanahato pulls out a mirror to see what the next step should be and discovers that the creator of the tower, Iglesia, curiously kicked the bucket, and if he were still alive, he could fix the barrier instantly. Besides him, the goddess assassin, Lord Masaki Kazuno, also bit the dust, and she would be in deep trouble if he were around. In light of this news, Vanahato says that Lionel could be nicknamed the Walking Apocalypse after all this. Therefore, Lionel says he'll end his life to stop this cycle of misfortune, but the goddess warns that even if he does, he'll go straight to the afterlife because she undid the resurrection magic at a safe point. And since he's going to die anyway, Vanahato invites Lionel to wait for the return of her beloved Albagarma. Soon she pulls the core of the barrier and warns that if she breaks it, the barrier will disappear. Then she breaks this long-standing seal that separates her from her beloved, causing the fall of Albagarma, which upon separating from the Divine King, falls directly into a river below, leaving the king confused, thinking his enemy was still alive. At this moment, Denura comments that he thought Takatu was joking when he said earlier that he killed the God of Darkness in the reflection, so the young man apologizes. Shortly after, Theodizia takes advantage of the distraction to cut Urab, and the blade monster that Denura thought he sensed on the stairs pierces Vanahato's body. However, Luke heals the master's wound and she rises exuding hatred, while Organ tries to rescue the God of Darkness. As he craves human sacrifices, Organ sends his demonic army to collect the soul of every human present. Faced with the attack, the Divine King protects the group near her with a magical barrier and Takatu asks the two companions to come closer to him and eliminates Organ along with all the demons. Danara questions why he asked them to stay so close, and he argues that this way it's easier to protect both. As for the goddess, Theodiza asks if it wouldn't be better to finish her off too, but Takatu thinks there's no reason for that since she wasn't hostile to him. Amidst this madness, Oi Hayanos arrives with her new servant, Hanakawa, and tries to reassure the guy, stating that they won't die because of this explosive magic rain as main characters are always protected by the plot to fulfill their role in the story. Upon reaching the group in the tower, she asks Rick if he knows Yajiri Takatu, but the warrior says it's not a good time for that. Oi agrees in analyzing the guy, she discovers that he has just become the sword master and Rick remembers that Urabe had mentioned something like that. Then she explains that all he has to do is pierce Vanaheda with the Or's sword to resolve the situation and Rick doesn't understand how this strange girl knows all of this. However, it's not the time to think too much, so he advances against the goddess and impales her with his magical weapon. Next, Oi looks for Takatu again, and Hanakoa can't stop crying because he's sure the guy will erase him as soon as he has the chance. Still, the dust settles and the protagonist appears with the two girls, so Oi tries to analyze him with her eye, but some glitch in the system prevents that from happening. Soon, she needles in distress and notes that Yajiri Takatu is the final destination of all destinies in the form of a man. For this reason, she questions alone how Cheyenne had the courage to summon such a being to that place. Danara notices the arrival of the two guys and asks what Hanakawa is doing there and the healer quickly puts the blame on Aoi, who is vomiting lunch on the floor. Takatu comments that maybe she's sick, and Oi herself says she'll be okay after a rest, apologizing for a reason Takatu doesn't understand. She explains that she came to return this guy back to them since they were classmates. As the group responds that they don't want Hanakawa back, she says she'll get rid of him right there, kicking him out shortly afterward. While Hanakawa confesses that he's developing a special taste for girls who humiliate him, Takatu asks how he managed to escape from the forest with a collar, and he confesses that he didn't mention that the collar's effect doesn't last forever. At dawn, Rick asks why Theodizia killed the Sword Master, and she fearlessly replies that she only avenged her people. As Rick is now the master and fearing that the half-demon might attack him too, tensions rise again, but Takatu calms both of them, saying he'll help resolve this deadlock by taking them both underground. Rick innocently asks what Yojiri could do in this situation as he has no abilities, and the Divine King tells the boy to watch how he speaks because Takatu was the one who defeated the God of Darkness and his army. Faced with this, the Sword Master asks who he really is and Takatu answers that he's an ordinary high school student who was summoned by a sage to this strange world. No one takes the boy too seriously, but soon everyone decides to go to the royal capital, each for their own reason, and Theodizia reveals she will look for her sister, Euphemia, there. Takatu recalls hearing that name somewhere, and the half-demon asks for information about it. As for the Divine King, she will return to the sanctuary in the royal capital since a thousand years have passed, and her lineage may have been extinct, 
while Rick will return to his home in the same city and offers to go with Danura and Taka too, but the two choose to travel alone. Soon after, we return to one of the students who didn't pick up the battle song, Ayaka Shinazaki. Alongside her classmate, Yuichiro Kiryu, both were killed by the dragon in the first episode. A mysterious artificial intelligence reveals to her that she is an android, a personality unit. But beyond that, she hears in her head this artificial intelligence is saying various things at the same time, apparently to other people as well. Finally, the AI asks if she wants to remain in this imitation human form or if she prefers to rid herself of restrictions and take the next step. Angry for being used as bait, Ayaka reveals that she doesn't want to die in this way. So the system removes her limitations and enables her as a battle unit, informing her that she needs to retrieve a large amount of materials and the dragon's mass would be enough to facilitate the android's recovery. Thus, Ayaka tears off a piece of the monster and devours it. Meanwhile, Asaka is ranting because they didn't even provide a cook for her in her Alpha Omega investigation work while finishing her burnt rice. When Yojuri Takatu tastes the meal prepared by the teacher, he finds the rice tough but sticky at the same time. Asaka asks if that's how you treat someone who just cooked for you. But Yojuri still finds the food disgusting. The girl loses patience and exclaims that complaining about a woman's food is the least attractive thing a boy could say. However, the boy has no idea what it means to be attractive, so Asaka tells him to eat and say it's delicious. Thus, the boy swallows some more rice and claims it's delicious, while the cook herself feels like throwing up her own food. Next, the teacher reads her instruction sheet, saying she needs to provide a minimum of education for the child, but she has no idea how to do that, and she doesn't even know if she's getting paid for this job. But soon, she tries to look on the bright side and prefers to think that teaching the basics to the kid shouldn't be difficult. So they both sit down to do some initial activities until a robotic girl enters the house to deliver supplies. Asaka asks if she happens to have any primary school books as well as a recipe book, a microwave, and a water filter. Maybe also a 43-inch smart TV with a video game, and lastly, the company of a little dog would be great. Paying attention to everything, the robot accepts the demands and leaves. Afterwards, Asaka takes a look at Yojuri's homework and calls him to get some fresh air. The woman finds it amazing that all this beautiful and peaceful scenery is beneath the surface, while the child finds it funny to have these floating materials everywhere. Despite the calm environment, Asaka fears she won't be able to return home alive from this job. Later, at the Institute of Life Forms Research, the teacher goes up to report on the June service and Shirei Shi finds it incredible that the woman survived the first month. Asaka claims she needs more people down there to handle so much work, but the scientist informs her that everyone asked for a way out of this job after the first day, so the teacher will have to deal with everything. He adds that he doesn't understand why people hate this job so much, so he asks Asaka if she hates it too. Without hesitation, she states that she detests it, and therefore, the researcher responds that he can make her effort worthwhile. Asaka opens an envelope given with a bunch of money, but she rants because all that money is useless down there. At that moment, the scientist is surprised by the woman's reaction and informs her that she can leave whenever she wants. So she is even more upset for not being told earlier, and Shiraishi responds that he didn't know that would be necessary because he thought she would have left on the first day of service. Anyway, since she can leave, Asaka wants to know who will keep an eye on the child, and the contractor reveals that the robots take care of everything, including cooking. So the woman leaves immediately to take a few days off. However, she soon wakes up in an unknown place, trying to remember how she ended up there. She recalls taking a stroll through the city, eating like a cow, buying some clothes, and finally spending a night in a five-star hotel. Therefore, she has no idea how she ended up in this cell. Soon, a voice informs her that they don't intend to harm her, and they are an organization that isolates calamities to prevent them from causing harm to the world. They wish to exchange a few words with Asaka. Meanwhile, Takatu discovers that Asaka took a vacation and becomes visibly sad, wondering if she will ever come back. Nikori tries to console the boy, but even the dog is feeling lonely in the absence of the teacher, so young Yojuri decides to look for Asaka. That said, he asks the robot where the woman would be, and as she replied that only the researchers would know that, Yojuri asks her to take him there. The robotic girl brings the boy to an invisible door that would lead outside, but it can't be opened from the inside as it is managed by the control room. Therefore, Takatu asks the authorities to open the door because he wants to get out, and this action was enough for all the employees to panic. When Shiraishi arrives to see what's going on, most have been eliminated while Alpha Omega crosses the corridors of the Institute. A last employee was following the orders of the paranormal, fearing for her life, so the research chief asks the security officer to shoot the woman, but Takatu knocks out the armed man. 
Immediately after, the child stands in front of Shiraishi asking where Asaka went, and the scientist informs that Asaka was taken away by the agency, a globally reaching organization, and therefore, no one can do anything to stop it. However, Takatu says he will find a way to fix this as long as no one tells Asaka what he did inside the institute. Determined, he sets out to find his new friend, destroying everything in his path and inside the agency, Adu seems to think that the ability of that child to kill anything he wants is nothing special. So they go on the hunt with a soldier who thought he had found a way to ambush the paranormal. Nevertheless, the three are also eliminated without ceremony while Asaka is languishing in her cell and wondering why she didn't get a normal job like everyone else. Still, she worries about Yojiri and wonders how he is at that moment, as a loud noise outside catches the teacher's attention. At this moment, the door swings open and a woman takes Asaka hostage as Takatu arrives to rescue his friend. The armed woman orders the boy not to move a muscle, threatening to blow Asaka's brains out, but the paranormal takes the aggressor's life before anything else happens. Afterward, he embraces Asaka and beckons her to leave with him. She witnesses the entire horror scene from the exterior of her cell, and the boy thinks it might change her mind about leaving with him, but Asaka squeezes Takatu's hand tightly and smiles at him. Upon arriving at the Alpha Omega shelter, Asaka is greeted joyfully by Mikori, who then asks Yajiri to play with the dog while she talks to Shirashi. She wants to know what they will do from now on, but the researcher responds that it's out of their hands as no one there could stop Alpha Omega's wrath. So Asaka inquires about her own future, and the scientist says he can't let her leave just yet, but he'll arrange some security for her to continue her work. Despite this, Asaka herself recognizes that leaving Yojiri as he is could lead to something very serious at any moment, so she decides to continue her lessons with him in an attempt to help the boy learn to live in society. At that moment, the child calls the teacher to play something, but when she approaches, she remembers she forgot her backpack with all her money at the agency. After this story, we return to the present time where Danara is watching the protagonist sleep, and Mokomoko comments that the girl could spend the rest of her life looking at this boy. Danara asks if the ghost can read others' minds or something similar, but she replies that Tamachika is not a difficult girl to interpret. Furthermore, Mokomoko asserts that Takatu is indeed a handsome young man, and it would be interesting to have some of that DNA in the Danara bloodline. With that, Tamachika thinks the ancestor has gone too far, but ultimately responds that this is a decision that also depends on Yojiri. At that moment, the boy wakes up and asks what decision they are talking about, so Danara avoids the topic and reminds them that they are in front of the royal capital, then asks what should be done now. But before any decision is made, the group notices they are surrounded by city authorities, and as they exit upon the leader's orders, he introduces himself as Torx, chief of security at the southern central gate, and questions what these young people are doing there with a vehicle from the immortal corps. For this reason, Takatu explains that the mayor of Hanabusa Ryuta, granted them this car, and they are candidates for Cheyenne Sage, needing to be in the capital for the selection process. Therefore, Torx analyzes Takatu's gift to see if they are indeed Sage candidates, but even with the positive result of the paranormal talent, the chief of security states that this kind of forgery is too easy to do. Danaro loses patience with the crude method of assessing a candidate, but at that moment, Takatu shows an artifact that makes all the officials kneel. And when the girl asks what that thing is, the protagonist explains that Rick instructed to show it if there were any problems in the royal capital, then passes one of those to Denera. Torx explains that it is an amulet with the emblem of the royal family and behind it appears David, the youngest member of the royal family, adding that this amulet indicates that they are known to Richard or that they are knights of the Divine King. To prove they are knights, they need to show the sacred sword they received from the sword master, but the duo doesn't even remember any weapon of that kind. Therefore, David wants them to prove they are royal knights in a duel against him, because warriors of this level would never lose to someone who has no skill handling a weapon. With that said, Takatu and Danura discuss what to do, and it's decided that the girl would go on to the battle, and Yojiri would intervene if things got ugly. Soon, the duel begins and Takatu analyzes that the noble's style is very orthodox. While Danura's seems different from everything as Mokomoko informs that the Danura family's motto is to confuse the opponent with unexpected movements. For example, Tamunchika is closing her left leg with her right, without the opponent noticing and gradually walking toward him without giving any hint that she's doing so. At the same time, she's swinging the blade to make the rival lose the sense of distance between them. Next, Danara throws the dagger up, runs behind the confused noble, and kicks him in the groin from behind, winning the battle. But if that wasn't enough, the girl claims she can go ahead and take David's life to seal her victory. However, the little effort was enough and Mokomoko celebrates with the certainty that Danara's fighting technique is like magic compared to the primitive methods of the Ice Kais. 
With the victory, the protagonists head to the capital, but Takatu is stopped by a magical barrier. David explains that they were built a long time ago by the High Mage Glacier, and that they can withstand any attack. Then the noble guides the duo through the city, where there were several explorers who came to face the underworld, from where the offspring of the God of Darkness are trying to escape, and this made Danara realize that Albagarma was not the only evil god there. After that, David is dismissed from his guiding duties, while Takatu and Danura need to come up with an excuse for how they managed to escape the bus. But first, they have to decide whether they will forgive their classmates or not as soon as they find them. Soon, they meet with the King of Mani, the royal capital, and he announces that all sage candidates must participate in a second mission. But before he can explain further, one of the candidates named Shinya Ushio stands up against the sovereign, asking if they are servants to follow so many orders. Because of this audacity, the king cuts the candidate's fingers, who realizes that the time-freezing technique of Master Eroge is not invincible. Then the king sits back down and concludes by saying that in order to become sages, everyone will have to achieve great feats. In the sequence, we see a scene where Wise Cheyenne approaches Aoi, but the girl is inconsolable because the Wise summoned Takatu to this world, which means it's the end of everything and she didn't ask to be involved in this. After all, that's not a human, not even a living being. So, Aoi's sword informs Cheyenne that her user has been like this for a long time, and information obtained through candidate Hanakawa indicates that this Takatu guy can eliminate his targets just by thinking about doing so. And speaking of the healer, he's throwing a tantrum in front of Loot saying that Yandri Takatu can finish off anyone in the blink of an eye. Because of this, Loot prefers to prioritize ending Takatu, and to ensure that it works out, he plans to ask for help from someone stronger than his master, and through the seal key, he can summon the sister of the Dark God. Her behavior was so chaotic that Albargama himself decided to seal her. With Loot having a creature of this level by his side, Hanakawa assumes that he won't be useful in this battle. So he tries to take his team off the field, but the descendant of the Dark God reminds him that he doesn't know this enemy well, and the healer would be useful for that reason. Returning to the candidate's trial, the King of Mani informs that crossing the Underworld and defeating the Dark God will be an invaluable feat in the eyes of the sages, and reveals to Ushio that the royal family has the power to weaken the gift, and that the boy's fingers must reconnect when he distances himself from the king. After that, Takatu asks what should be done now, and Danura draws the attention of the whole group, who are impressed by the return of the two classmates. In the meantime, the Divine King returns to the royal capital and comments on how this city has never been as big as it is now. Once there, Archbishop Hullerus receives the king as his highness, leader of the Axis Church, then takes his leader to his quarters and learns that the Dark God of the Canyon has been defeated, Soon he asks about the seal key, and as soon as the Divine King responds that he doesn't know what it is, the Archbishop uses the key to control him. Returning to the protagonists, they finally reunite with Suburu Yazaki, who says he doesn't regret leaving them behind as it was the right decision to make. Takatu replies that he really doesn't care, while Danara makes it clear that she was annoyed, but complaining won't change anything. Still, she asks the student leader if it would have been better for them not to have returned, and when Yazaki starts to stutter, a girl from the idol class named Sora Kino joins the conversation and says that it's important to have good allies in these difficult times. Izaki disagrees because he doesn't know if he can trust the duo, and Akino agrees from his perspective, because if he were abandoned, he would surely seek revenge. Faced with the morality of that girl with Yazaki, Takatu and Danura notice that she's the one who truly holds sway there. Shortly after, Takatu is introduced to two more classmates, one of whom is Yugo Azumita, a blue-haired boy from the cook class capable of preparing delicious recipes. The other is Yukamasa Aihara from the reader class who can read any language. They both introduced themselves as the classic failures of the class and thought Takatu was one too because his class is Insect Hunter, which causes instant death to all insects. Then Sigichi Fukai from the Death God class who can instantly eliminate any target appears in the room and asks to speak with Takatu. Meanwhile, Denura is getting to know Shinya Ushio's class, the candidate who lost his fingers to the king who is a master of Eroges, just like Keishi Munakata. Mitsuo Yatate is from the Eroge Maniac class. The three together are known as the Three Eroge Nobles, and their abilities reflect their personalities. Ushio can stop time while Munakata has X-ray vision and Yatate has tentacles. At this point, Ryuko Minomiya tells Denura that she needs to talk about Takatu, who Fukai was calling Lord Okakushi. Since Fukai is a death god, he doesn't need to leave everything in Takatu's hands again, a soul taker. He was instructed to observe Takatu, but never allowed to look directly into his eyes, so he hears out when his eyes responsible for detecting the supernatural. 
However, Fukai lost this power as soon as he arrived there and believes that Takatu hasn't unleashed all this power since he arrived in this world. After that, he leaves and the other boys comment on how strange that kid is. Soon after, the samurai Nanomiya manages to reunite with Takatu and apologizes to him. While she orders Carol, the American ninja, to do the same, since the first gate was opened and that means no matter where they are, he can end both of them instantly. Takatu says he wouldn't do that, but the way the girl expressed it was a bit annoying. Then he asks why everyone there seems to know him and Carol replies that she's part of the agency, while Ryuko is from the institute and Fukai belongs to the cult and the three were sent to keep an eye on Takatu. Thus, he understands why he always felt watched and asks for explanations for what's happening there. Elsewhere, Euphemia is alone reflecting on where her older sister Theo might be until one of Lane's memories emerges and attacks the girl, claiming that Euphemia is the last part she needs to become the hair of the original blood. Back to Denura, she and Takatu discover that the group leader Sora Akino is an idol who possesses the ability of the vow, where she prevents the target from using their gift, and if the person breaks that vow, they will depart from this world immediately. So Takatu explains that he's there to meet wise Cyan, because she might know something about how to get back home. But apparently, the only way to get her attention is by achieving something great, as the King of Mani said. Therefore, Takatu believes that Asuva and Carol are on his side, and the two fully agree. Later, the girls from the group are gathered in the underworld, discussing the outfits that the team's seamstress, Runa Harufuji, made for them. Akina was wearing an outfit that looks nothing like something from the parallel world, but provides good defense, while Carol is in a not-so-subtle ninja tunic for her profession. Asuva is embarrassed about her kimono and Yugo Taini, the cheerleader class, is dressed appropriately. Finally, Denura is wearing armor from the self-centered blacksmith, a class with the ability to create weapons and protective equipment for personal use. Following that, the team's guide, Rick, appears, now the sword master. On the men's side, the guide is David, a member of the royal family because his family had the ability to seal things, suppressing low-level demons. Consultant Haruto Otori comments that it will be important to measure everyone's abilities, so he suggests that David try to suppress the group's power. The guide agrees and prepares to send everyone near the demons. Meanwhile, Rick realizes that he doesn't even need to be there to help because the girls are handling everything on their own and Danura is surprised to discover that he is also a prince of the Mani Kingdom. To test his strength, Danura engages in a duel against some creatures, and with Mokomoko's help, they work together to easily defeat their enemies, leaving the entire group stunned. Takatu is avoiding drawing too much attention with his instant death ability. As he has a barrier that eliminates any target that tries to kill him, he points his sword at the gorilla and waits for it to impale itself on the blade because it will be dead upon crossing the barrier. Everyone is impressed with Yojiri's ease in dealing with opponents and David asks how he can avoid monster attacks so easily, moving like an amateur. Takatu ignores the question and asks the consultant if he should demonstrate his insect hunting ability, but Utoru responds that it's not necessary. During this mission, Loot and Hanakawa are in the middle of the capital, and the descendant of the Dark God is disguised as a woman to avoid recognition. The healer can't tolerate the boy in a wig because if he really wanted to pass as a woman, he would have to reset his entire personality to play the role properly. Loot comments on the city being full and asks if there's a festival or something similar, and Hanako responds that the boy looks like a country bumpkin in the big city by asking such a thing. Luke points out that the healer has been too relaxed since finding out he wouldn't be killed and reveals that the Dark God's younger sister is somewhere nearby underground. As he doesn't know where the entrance to the underworld is, he needs to gather information first, and Hanakoa believes the tavern is the right place for that. As for Euphemia, she reflects on being an origin blood until a frightened horse appears in front of her, and the girl orders it to stop. Right behind, a child runs desperately after the animal until she sees it tamed by the woman in front of her. The little girl apologizes for not being able to control her horse, but as soon as she realizes who the child is, Euphemia bows and introduces herself. Since the girl has no name to provide, she decides to call herself Risley. Loot arrives at the tavern and asks the waitress if there's a festival in the city. She says that the sage's candidates have already reached the fifth level of the underworld a few days after starting their conquest, so everyone is celebrating. After the woman leaves, Hanakawe observes the three nobles of Eroj and warns that it wouldn't be good to be seen by them. Then, Loot uses a recognition blocker not to be noticed, and the healer thinks it's a good opportunity to approach the three without being seen. Speaking of the devil, Lucio is ranting about Takatu's arrival, who simply appeared out of nowhere, took all the beautiful girls, and left. Because of this, Munakata envies that Guy and Yetate believes they deserve much more recognition for doing much more than him. At that moment, a girl approaches asking if everyone there is a sage's candidate, 
and the boys think they're finally getting the attention of the girls, but soon find out it's Ayaka Shinokazi, the girl everyone left behind on the bus. She starts hitting Ushio, and his friends try to stop her, but without success. With one punch after another, Ayaka blows Ushio's head, warns that she'll get each of them every day, and tells them to inform the entire class. Analyzing the situation, Hanakawa imagines that the girl must be possessed for being left behind, and that means he is definitely a target too. Next, Saiyan the Sage nullifies Lute's recognition magic and reaches Hanakawa. The boy tries to escape, saying he needs to gather information on how to get to the underworld, so Shayan decides to tell him everything. Lute tells the boy to calm down because nothing good will come from opposing that person, and Shayan wishes to ask questions about Takatu in exchange for the information she will provide. Even though she thinks it's safer to eliminate the boy to avoid more problems, she believes she could use him in some way. Loot warns that he will take care of Takatu, but Shayan taunts the boy, asking if a mere subordinate of the Dark God can handle it. Then she tells Hanakawa that no one needs him anymore and summons a heat ray toward him, but the spell turns into whipped cream. The healer asks the sage to explain about the underworld before getting rid of him, so she reveals that you can see entrances everywhere, and it's even possible to buy a ticket at the tavern. Hanakawa is frustrated for not realizing it was so easy, and then asks Shayan if she's not going to end him now. In turn, she believes she doesn't need to do that since his goal is to enter the underworld. In the meantime, Danara informs Takatu that they reached the edge of the fifth level of the underworld, so they should start the sixth tomorrow. Takatu emphasizes that there's a dark god on the seventh level, but that everything should be fine as long as Shine is present. Regarding the death of those guys from Eroge, he learns that Shinozaki finished off Ushio and will take care of the rest of the group, surprising Takatu and Danara since they saw that girl dead in front of them. Meanwhile, Shayan is informed that the candidates are near the sixth level of the underworld. In response, she thinks it's too easy for them, so she intends to make things more difficult, but Yuichi reminds her that defeating the Dark God is not a simple task. As for Takatu, the leader doesn't know what to do yet. At the same time, Utori uses his problem-solving ability to find that place and asks the stage to extend the mission deadline. With that, Saiyan says she can grant that wish as long as the consultant gets rid of Takatu. Meanwhile, the system was developing Ayaka with new abilities, this time imbuing her with techniques from the dragon language where her sense of evasion improves infinitely, allowing her to fly and attack with the characteristics of the mythological creature. Amidst this, the girl was informed that the sniper had been found and she immediately flew towards the enemy, finding atop a tower a boy named Riona Shureyama, from the gorilla class, who claims that if he doesn't defeat Ayaka today, he won't be able to sleep in peace anymore. Thus, Riona punches Ayaka's shield several times, but the girl uses the dragon's claw and removes one of the opponent's arms. Because of this, Riona laments that his real power is sealed, and when Ayaka wonders what he's talking about, the system informs that the royal family of that area is capable of weakening the gift, and Ayaka decides to duel with the boy again when he recovers his sealed powers. Far from there, Lute and Hanakawa enter the underworld, and the descendant of the God of Darkness imagines that his master's sister must be on the top floor. Panicked, the healer asks if Lute plans to go up floor by floor with his chest exposed, and he responds that he can leave Hanakawa behind if he prefers. Suddenly, Lady Mana, sister of the God of Darkness, appears near them, having sensed her brother's scent, so she follows the aroma in hopes of finding him. As the dark forces gather strength, the leader of the Black Garden Assassin Guild, Ryusuke Mayanaga, receives an order to eliminate Yajiri Takatu. He, along with Denure, is hiding in an inn, and Yojiri shows in a vase of flowers that he is learning to control his power, which might be important when they gather information from the sage. Besides that, Denure asks if he's going to continue lying down all day, but Takatu responds that he took a walk around the city. By the way, he felt like he was being watched by someone during his stroll so he asks his friend for help. Back to Lute, the sister of the God of Darkness reveals that she is sealed in the underworld, and she doesn't know why, but since it was her brother who left her there, she believes he must have had a good reason for it. Curiously, Hanakawa asks how she can reach the door of the underworld, since it's sealed, and the entity replies that her kind brother created a dungeon so free that she could leave whenever she wanted. Attentive to this, Lute presumes that the God of Darkness used all this power to hold mana there, but even that wasn't enough. By the way, Mana sends her brother's scent on loot, so she wants to know if the child possesses Albagarma's belongings. Starting to get scared by the woman's strange demeanor, loot hands the sealing key to Mana, who is delighted. Back to Bayaka, she informs the system that she found the king's chamber and an individual who seems to be the sovereign. Soon, she blasts through the tower wall where the king of Mania is lodged, and he wants to know who the hell this intruder is. Paying no mind, Ayaka says that the seal to weaken the gift is a nuisance, so she wants it deactivated. 
The king tries to attack the combat unit, but her dragon scale repels his powerful magic, and she retaliates with the dragon's fang, executing the monarch without ceremony and even mocking the fact that he died too easily for someone so confident. Next, she asks the girl who was accompanying the man if he was the king, and as soon as she confirms it, Ayaka tells her that the seal must be deactivated with his death. Meanwhile, Mana leads the two adventurers to a bizarre place full of children generated by her and her brother. Hanakawa asks what's going on, but Lute explains that it's not what he's thinking, and that these offspring were generated by Mana's imagination. Continuing her attack, Ayaka arrives where her enemy, Riona, was in turn under the care of nurse Akari Misano. Seeing that the boy's arm has been restored, she wishes to return to the fight with him, provided that the seal has been removed. Without hesitation, Riona rushes at her rival and his overwhelming strength subdues the combat unit with fast and powerful blows. However, once again she uses the dragon's fan, which removes the opponent's arm again. Ryoma tries to stay in the fight, but Ayaka traps him with her dragon tail and squeezes until the boy explodes. Elsewhere, Takatu and Danura are walking through the city, alert to any strange movements and the protagonist is thinking of eliminating a pursuer to find out where he's from. Danura asks if Takatu could buy her some food, and thus the two discuss where they could eat, while the sniper is being tortured by a girl using a device that generates pain to the shooter, forcing him to finish the target if he wants to get rid of this suffering. However, as he clearly intended to hit Takatu, the sniper is taken out instantly, so the girl has the idea of trying to aim at Denura next time, and the guild leader, Ryusuk, agrees with the idea while monitoring the process. Next, Denura arrives in front of the restaurant where she wanted to eat, but Ayaka had devastated the place completely, which leaves Tamachika outraged. At that moment, Takatu hugs the girl and sees a man taking a shot right next to them. Ryosuke assumes that this is the strategy that might work until Takatu looks directly at him through the camera and tells him to wait where he is because he'll arrive soon. To help in the search for enemies, Mokomoko discovers the origin of the electromagnetic waves, and as the enemy tries to flee in his helicopter, Takatu nullifies the propellers, and as Ryosuke activates his parachute, Danara throws him on the ground with force. As he gets up, Takatu warns that he will take his life if he tries to run. As he didn't flee, Alpha Omega presumes that the individual knows what power he has, but he seems to have no idea. In the meantime, Mokomoko shows him a spirit that tried to attack the group asking if that's what he was looking for, and Ryoshu can't understand how the spirit princess was defeated, because it's an ultimate spirit that rules over all others. Calmly, Mokomoko replies that there is no spirit that can stand up to her and Danura observes that it's the first useful thing the ancestor does and she's already acting so high and mighty. Anyway, if the spirit of the right hand is the princess, surely the one of the left hand is the king, so Mokomoko crushes both against each other, causing the enemy's reaction who attacks with Ephemerer. As Takatu eliminates the wolf effortlessly, the queen of the dead world, Yama, steps forward to seal the deal between her and her conjurer, even though Ryoshuk has not yet given up the battle. Unconcerned, the queen continues her ritual to finalize her summoning, but Takatu finishes her off before that. Coming as a surprise, the guild member throws a knife at Takatu and Denura grabs the dagger before it hits him. Yojiri doesn't seem to care about this and soon reaches the aggressive girl and deactivates Enju with a voice command. Denura wants to know how he did it, but decides to explain later and orders the enemy to reveal all he knows. However, it's not just that individual who's hunting Yojiri, but also the candidate from the consultant class, Utori, who's studying his target and realizing that he's practically invincible besides appearing indifferent to everything happening around him. Back to Luke, he apologizes to Hanakawa for driving him into this strange world, and although the healer doesn't believe the entity is serious, Luke proves his good faith by giving his companion an artifact indicating that Hanakawa is a representative of the Dark God, ensuring that Mana doesn't end his life whenever she pleases. It's not like Hanakawa wants to die, but he questions why Luke didn't keep this artifact himself since it's so important and Luke explains that he's going to die anyway because he let his master be destroyed too easily, meaning Mana will finish him off. Hanakawa laments this, but Lute seems to accept his fate, confessing that traveling with his companion was better than he thought. Meanwhile, Takatu decides to eliminate the enemy, even though he's told everything he knows, since he has the power to create any object from this world, which means he can produce as many Enju clones as he wants. Ryoshu panics and argues that there are many people who can do that in this world, but as the guild leader's terror irritates Takatu, he prefers to erase the enemy at once. Thus, Luke and Hanakawa accompany the Dark God's sister to another seal that was created to protect the woman. Hanakawa sees no sense in a seal that the person can break out of at any time, and at that moment a keyhole appears before him with a frame of the artifact he received. Back at the hotel, 
Takatu explains that Enju Sumeraji was a friend he used to play with when he was little, and this robot was created with her as a model, a robot created to kill Takatu. Now, his wish is to give his friend the rest she deserves, finally. With this statement, Danara thinks the girl has died, but Yojuri explains that she's certainly doing fine somewhere, eating sweets in bed while reading a magazine. So Ganara says it doesn't make sense for the boy to talk about her like that if his friend is so calm in life, so Takatu explains that he was talking about the robot because he doesn't want an android like Enju wandering around. In the meantime, Ayaka continues relentless in her goal, this time facing off against Yugo Izumita. She advances against him and Yugo manages to cut the girl's arm, who believed the dragon scale blocked everything. However, being from the cook class, Yugo is capable of cutting any kind of ingredient that exists. Irritated, Ayaka uses the dragon claw to cut the cook into pieces, but his cooking skills make him make use of every piece of himself to serve several dishes at once, so each part of his body becomes a clone. Yugo intends to make a dragon stew for dinner, but Ihara reads that the fate of those two will be very different from what was planned because, according to her reading, Ayaka's flames will roast the cook until he turns to dust. As predicted, the combat unit dodges Yugo's attack and covers the entire territory with its fire. Several meters away, Mokomoko uses his vision, six times sharper than normal to spot the boy's classmate, Ayaka Shinazaki, but at that moment she flies away with her wings. Faced with the catastrophe, the leader of the candidates, Sora, assesses that they are only 18 units because eight have already been annihilated by Ayaka. Everyone present there is desperate with the strength of that enemy, but Sora believes that Ayaka has been able to eliminate the students because she's picking them off one by one, although Danara recalls that the three Eroge nobles were destroyed in the blink of an eye. So Sora reveals finally that they have been ordered to leave the kingdom immediately, because it will be ruined at any moment. Therefore, to fulfill the objective, the leader orders everyone to descend to the underworld, now to end this soon. Thus, Takatu and Denura present themselves on the sixth floor of the dungeon, and David accompanies the duo after volunteering because he wanted to see the sixth floor with his own eyes. Still, Takatu asks the noble to be careful, but he thinks everything will be fine because the only thing they need to do is defeat the Dark God. Meanwhile, Rumiko Jugasaki from the accountant class counts exactly 597 enemies gathering to face the adventurers, who have no choice but to confront the army. But as this class is useless in combat, Suguri Izaki takes the lead and attacks the enemy forces in formation. The candidates show their might and take down the monsters one by one. During the war, Lu tells Mana that her brother, Albagarma, died and that's why he seeks revenge. Mana responds that she will avenge that, but first she needs to give birth to her brother. So she steals Lute's two arms to materialize part of the Dark God. Then she intends to take the descendant's brain, but Hanakawa begs for him to be spared. Mana promises to spare Lute as long as the healer opens the seal, and that's what he does. Meanwhile, the candidates celebrate their victory with a feast. Rubiko asks Danara if Takatu is her type as she seems interested in him. However, Danara avoids the topic and goes to look for his friend. Isolated, Yojuri sees David staggering before him completely out of it. Following the noble, he prevents him from touching a strange energy in a crater. At the banquet, Wutori is celebrating their arrival without major issues, but Cheyenne thinks that's exactly the problem. True sages shouldn't be able to complete the course with such easy objectives. Thus, she announces the beginning of the awakening event, where everyone will compete until only one candidate is left standing. Additionally, Ryuko receives an alert that the second door has been opened. At that moment, Danara is searching for Takatu, who fell at the beginning along with David. On the other side in the New World, Theodizia ambushes a caravan and attacks its defenders. She takes down the first two with the element of surprise, but the other three, who were alerted, manage to fend off her next attack. The mage who invoked the magic shield used the energy of the four half-demons to protect himself, which enrages Theodizia at the audacity of treating her kin like that. Therefore, she casts a spell of fire so powerful that it breaks through the men's barrier, causing them to flee after becoming vulnerable. With victory secured, Theodizia opens the barrels and sees the captured half-demons, while one of the men who tried to escape is slaughtered by her younger sister, Euphemia. Behind them, a carriage approaches down the road. Turning to the candidates for Sage, Cheyenne warns that the event will begin in an hour, and those who haven't eliminated anyone an hour after the start will be killed, along with those who leave the castle walls. The survivor will be the winner. Fukai challenges the sage and retorts that in that case, she should die. Unconcerned, Shine warns that it doesn't matter because if he manages to kill her, the judgment will end. Due to her indifference, Fukai questions if their gift doesn't work on the girl and she explains that it's not quite like that, but he has a much better chance of surviving by participating normally in the proposed event, instead of trying to cause trouble for her. 
However, Fukai doesn't listen and uses his instant death ability on Shion, who indeed loses her life, but regains it instantly. Fukai uses his power several times in a row, but as Shion levels up in second intervals, she fully recovers each time she's hit by the ability. Faced with this, as Fukai doesn't stop insisting, Shion grows tired and bursts his head like a balloon, while instructing the remaining competitors to prepare themselves. Meanwhile, Danora is searching for Takatu until Jugasaki and Shijo ask for help from their friend. At that moment, we see the protagonist falling from the abyss with David in his arms as Asaka tells little Yojiri about a book she read long ago that spoke of a being that surpassed humans, with the word ethos appearing in the story. In the case of the book, this word was translated as character, because it's impossible to apply the fundamentals of human morals and ethics to these beings, so they must create their own code of conduct. However, Takatu must be aware that being able to do everything doesn't mean he should go around doing whatever he wants. On the contrary, he must reflect deeply to decide what character he wishes to possess, so that it guides his actions in the most dignified manner. However, if Takatu follows the rules he set, he will die instantly. And he promised to return Denura to the original world, so he suppresses his own impulse and gently lands on the seventh layer. Nearby, the disappearance of the seal makes Mana interpret that her brother gave her permission to leave, so Hanakawa asks if he can leave as well. Considering the request, Mana foresees that she will soon get irritated if she continues to look at that guy's ugly face, so she allows him to depart. The healer tries to escape with loot, but Mana's body had expanded to encompass the entire palace, and the ground had softened to the point of impeding walking. Seeing no way out, Luke kicks his friend out, since he has free passage through the underworld and is devoured by the body of the Dark God's sister. Far away inside the mysterious carriage, Little Risley explains to Theodizia that her sister has become an origin blood, and as Euphemia can sense the presence of her people, they decided to continue searching for him. So Theodizia joins the search, and the three decide to go to the royal capital to look for Takatu. Speaking of Alpha Omega, he asks Mokomoko to notify him when things start to get ugly in the judgment imposed by Cheyenne and soon sees Hanakoa being attacked by a grotesque giant jelly. The healer falls before the boy, who remembers having said he would kill Hanakoa the next time he found him, but he begs Takatu to deal with the blue goo before anything else. Then Takatu eliminates the sticky substance and asks the runaway if he knows a way to the sixth layer since he fell flying here and can't return the same way. Hanakoa complains that this guy really is capable of doing anything he wants in life, and then explains that he will need a shortcut, and as there are a bunch of those walking jellies around there, Takatu offers Hanakoa protection in exchange for the guide's work, as long as he carries David on his back. Amidst this confusion, the judgment begins and Danara observes Takakura the gunslinger, receiving the information that Akino's vote ability was deactivated. As soon as she enters one of the castle's rooms, Ahara predicts through his script that he's going to get shot, so he changes the course of the story to throw Ayaka Shinozaki into the same room as the gunslinger. Back to Denura, Mokomoko notifies that Takatu fell on the seventh floor and doesn't know how to return, but she informed his location. Denura understands and remembers that no system was installed in her, so it should be fine to hide there, until the shots heard in the castle indicate that the battle has finally begun. Mokomoko explains that people are acting through the system, which makes them much more aggressive. Meanwhile, Hanakawa reaches the desired location and informs that he will leave the two on the sixth floor and return to the first, but Takatu reminds him that he can't operate that thing without the healer, so he must go along. Following the script, Ihara reaches a metal door and tries to open it, but fails. But as he turns around, he reads that Takatu and Hanakawa are about to enter through there with David on their backs, and he thinks this is a good opportunity to kill all of them at once. Therefore, he manipulates the script to collapse the ceiling and crush the three, but the book always led to Ihara's death result, regardless of what he wrote. Enraged, she tears out the page to try to rewrite his fate, but at that moment, Takatu arrives and finishes the job. Hanakawa asks how this guy has the courage to erase a classmate out of nowhere, but Yojiri argues that he felt the intention to kill coming from him. Shortly after, they are notified that Hanakawa has been included in the judgment event, which means he is now trapped there. Because if he tries to escape, he will have to deal with Cyan. In the midst of this, Mei Hanamiya from the Sango class peacefully dreams in her bed with her kittens, who insists that the girl give up this contest and take them on a trip. However, someone named Arima asserts that she is lazily lying in their domain and Mei wants to know why he didn't kill her. So Arima explains that he doesn't take pride in doing so, but he's willing to do what needs to be done. Therefore, he erases the bed where the girl was lying and drops a concrete block on top of her. In this way, Osamu Arima, from the carpenter class, thought he had gotten rid of the target, but Mai had used her teleportation to escape death and appear to the two assailants. She sees that Masahiro Abukawa, 
From the teleporter class, was also in the midst of the fray, and he is surprised that the Santo class has abilities beyond eliminating demonic creatures. Maxki teleports litters of lava onto the girl, but she is immune to all attacks, and soon delights in the total despair of her opponents as they realize there is no escape, especially after being so full of themselves. So she delivers the perfect Santo punch to the teleporter, who evaporates instantly. Terrified, Arima asks what kind of power this is, and May explains that a few days before the school trip, she witnessed an insane magical battle between two cats. One of them ended up killing the girl with a beam of light, but they revived her and gave her powers through a connection with the cat god as an apology. Seeing that Mai possesses great strength, Arima argues that her classmate could end Cheyenne and prevent everyone from killing each other, but even though she agrees with that, the girl wouldn't want to destroy the sage and deprive herself of participating in such an exciting event. So Mei unleashes the Santo beam on the carpenter and evaporates him in the same way. At that moment, she receives notification that Hanakawa is in the game, and decides to kill him since she has the opportunity. Thus, she teleports to where her target is, and the healer soon begins to cry because of his classmate's Santa dress, imagining the sacred things that must exist beneath that dress. Disgusted, Mei attacks with the Santo punch, but Takatu stops her with a well-placed din or elbow to the aggressor's rib. Hanakawa asks if he's not going to erase the girl, but Takatu responds that they weren't attacked in any way that would endanger their lives. Then Mei gets in touch with the cats and asks them to join the fun, but just as she was about to use the power of the two in the fight, Yogiri eliminates her classmate's magic source and leaves her powerless, so she quickly flees into the forest. At the same time, Takakura and Ayaka engage in a mortal battle, and the android notes that her opponent can summon weapons at will. Outside, Denera is fed up with hiding. While Mokomoko feels that someone is there using the spirits and releasing them, and an electromagnetic disturbance is occurring, which will prevent her from contacting Takatu. Because of this, it would be better for the two not to stay put and be found, so they leave and come across several ghosts, while Makochi emerges seeking her friend. She explains that she belongs to the necromancer class, while Denaro wants to know where Jiyuma is, but her friend responds that she simply disappeared and tells her that she ended up there after encountering a spirit guide named Tayanu princess of an ancient species. Seeing that, Denera says she wants one like that because her spirit guide has a much stranger name. Mokomoko argues that her name is beautiful and jealousy makes her want to destroy Tanu. However, Makochi explains that the princess is only good for counting and therefore needs a more useful companion, like Mokomoko, so she possesses the spirit of the Denera family. Next, she attacks Tomachika and knocks down a gigantic tree with a blow, because she's using Mokomoko's powers, which includes being in control of the battle armor the enemy is wearing. Then, Makochi activates the cleaning process of the garment, but before the magic happens, Takatu punches Hanakawa in the eyes so he doesn't see Denura's armor dissolving. With the healer suffering on the ground, he approaches and clothes Denura with his jacket, and the girl thanks him for the help. Although the timing of his friend isn't the best, now, analyzing the opponent, Takatu realizes that Mokomoko is trapped inside Makochi's body, but since she's a threat, he has no choice but to eliminate his classmate. In another part of the forest, Yazaki had gathered a group to strengthen themselves enough to face the sage and tries to get Akino to join the team. But the idol class candidate refuses and taunts by saying that the boy is offended because she took his leadership. In response, Yazaki orders his team to surround the girl and attack, but at that moment she summons fanatical fans who are capable of doing anything for their idol, including exploding themselves with their enemies. After Yazaki retreats, Utori realizes that there's no chance of facing that enemy until blue slimes appear and attack the girls around him. The consultant notes that he'll have to use his secret weapon and flies with bird wings, but instead of helping his classmates, he flies up high and sees that the situation is really bad over there. Back in Maikochi, she feels deep within her the dread of Mokomoko, who is terrified by the arrival of a strange being offering the girl the true power of a necromancer through awakening, if Makochi abandons the source of her fear. So she banishes Mokomoko and feels the surge of power coursing through her entire body as she declares that the whole world will bow at her feet. However, when she unleashes all her necromantic energy mass, Takatu eliminates the monster formed alongside its host. Mokomoko starts apologizing for everything that's happened, but Denera just wants her clothes back. Then she mourns her friend's departure but understands that one has to do what needs to be done, so it's time to lift her head and move forward. With this in mind, Takatu takes advantage of Hanakawa's presence to try to escape the battlefield, even though Cheyenne notices and comes to attack the group. Hanakawa pleads with the guy to rethink this idea because he has no guarantee that he'll be spared in this whole ordeal. So Takatu promises to avenge his colleague's death, which makes him even more desperate. 
At that moment, Ayaka finally knocks down Takakura, who desperately tries to find a weapon capable of defeating her opponent, but before she could be killed, a container with liquid is summoned in front of them. Meanwhile, Ryuko and Carol manage to catch up with Takatu's group and decide to join them, but at the same time, a red mass takes over the environment, soon exploding into catastrophic proportions. In a short time, 60% of Ayaka's body had disappeared with the impact. The medical unit tasked with caring for the android warns that faced with this, Ayaka has two options – wait for natural healing or instantly recover with the dragon's cure. Without hesitation, the android chooses the second alternative, but the auxiliary unit warns that this procedure will cause an irreversible change because this cure includes dragon transformation. Faced with the end, Ayaka sticks to her decision and activates the cure, thus becoming a dragon. Meanwhile, Takatu and his group try to understand what's happening around them, and the protagonist assumes they were victims of an annihilation bomb, which causes a huge explosion and then heat and shockwaves sweep everything away, spreading nanomachines everywhere. Startled, Denera asks how the heck this guy knows all this, while Ryuko notices that even the second gate is violating the laws of physics. In the midst of the shockwave, Ayaka seeks her revenge even after being transformed into a dragon. But she is warned by the assistant that, due to the circumstances, her search abilities have been restricted by the sage. But Ayaka could use the dragon warrior. And when she tests this ability, warriors born from her huge teeth are placed in formation. From afar, Hanakawa sees this army and Denora asks if this is Ayaka Shinozaki's doing. The troops rush towards the five survivors, but Takatu eliminates them all at once. With this, Ayaka and her assistants discuss what could be the reason for the destruction of the army in the blink of an eye, and soon they see that among the survivors is Yajiri Takatu, the Alpha Omega. The assistant warns that due to Ayaka's irreversible transformation into a dragon, the recognition blocking function may have been suspended. Ayaka asks why this is, then discovers that the assistants of the former android are a new generation human project, created in case humanity was annihilated by the Alpha Omega. For this, they were equipped with functions that prevent an equipped Alpha Omega from recognizing them. But as this function isn't working, the most lucid course of action is to retreat. However, Ayaka is not pleased with this idea because she has come to the point of becoming a dragon to continue her thirst for revenge, and now that she has come this far, it wouldn't be a simple boy who would stop her. Therefore, she attacks the group with all her might and Denera realizes that it is the same creature they defeated on the bus. As always, Takatu erases the enemy on the spot and the project representatives announce that the personality unit has been destroyed. However, one of them points out that the fact that they are still alive shows that it is a good deal to multiply independent personality units among themselves. In the midst of this, Adenura approaches the corpse and is certain that it was Ayaka, while Hanakoe insists that they should leave quickly because they can't know what else might emerge in the midst of this mist. Walking a little longer, the healer observes that no clue has been found yet as to what might have happened and that maybe even the sage himself doesn't know what's going on, but then Shine appears next to the healer and replies that she understands everything perfectly. Shine asks if the guy there is Yajiri Takatu, but after her question, she falls to the ground without explanations. Takatu says he knows Shan's mission is to kill him, and Hanakoa asks what's happening, so the Alpha Omega explains that he killed her left ankle. Then he demands that Shine answer his questions, and instead, she tries to kill the enemy, but Takatu's threat elimination function ends the girl's attempt. He warns her to stop these idiotic ideas, and that if she tries to use an instant death ability to stop his heart, she would die before she could use it. In fact, Takatu believes Cyan was aware of this since she targeted him. Soon, the boy erases two fingers of the sage and warns that he will continue erasing each part of her body if she refuses to answer the questions. Faced with this, Shine teleports to escape. Returning home, Shine removes her affected hand and another one is born in its place, but the same fingers remain motionless. Therefore, she rages and confesses that she has no idea how this is possible, and at that moment, Takatu continues erasing parts of her body, as he had warned. Shine asks why she would say what he wants if she's going to die anyway, until Yuchi enters the chief's room to see how she's doing, and his arms and legs are incapacitated by Takatu. Distraught because of her affection for her subordinate, Shine decides to return to her enemy and ask him to stop the attacks, deciding to cooperate with his demands. Takatu explains that he can attack the target wherever it may be, including allies that he's seeing. Listening to the conversation, Hanakoa despairs at this turn of events, while Carol now understands the reason Ryuko joined the Alpha Omega at all costs. Takatu asks how he can return home like Hanakoa did years ago, but Shine explains that the healer used the connection that existed between this world and theirs, however that connection is gone now, and today it's not possible to escape from there. Faced with this, Takatu asks for the coordinates to his world, and the sage displays an endless amount of numbers. 
Everyone is terrified by the amount of stuff written there, but Mokomoko asserts with conviction that she is capable of memorizing these coordinates and to try to show Tomachika that she will need her assistance later on. However, besides the coordinates, the group would need energy to return home, so Shagan hands a philosopher's stone to Takatu, but says he will need more if he wants enough energy to return. Takatu asks if she won't need it, but as Cyan replied that it doesn't depend on that kind of thing, he accepts the stone and asks if the other sages he killed also had a philosopher's stone with them. Shine explains that yes, but the stones of the sages who are eliminated by Takatu lose their power after all, the stone is the signal of their immortality. Soon, Takatu realizes that this will take forever, and therefore wants to know where the other sages are. Shine responds that she doesn't necessarily know all of them, so Takatu asks Hanakoa to check the map for the exit. The healer opens the map to confirm, but before that, he asks if Shine will be left behind as if nothing had happened. Takatu says his only objective was to gather information, and although he hates Shine, that's not enough reason to kill her. With the group's departure, Shine remembers that she needs to help Yuchi, but as she tries to return, she is attacked by red slimes that reach her body. The sage tries to teleport, but for some reason, he can't. Then Mana appears and comments that she thought it was her immune system reacting to something, but it seems it's just a fly that calls herself wise. Shine asks if that entity is a dark god and frees herself from the slime by leaving her leg behind. She thinks to herself that the test for the sage has always been extremely difficult, but surely this is going too far. By the way, Mana deactivates all of Shine's abilities and mocks this fictitious world created by the sage with such meticulousness. Finally, she says that even a fly has its function in the fauna and she soon uses Cyan as food for her brother. As the slime takes over the defenseless body of the wise, she tells the entity to remember the name Yajuri Takatu because that's the person who will kill her. Later, while remembering Yuchi, the slime takes over her body completely. Sometime later, Man attacks the royal capital causing despair among the city's defenses. One of the guards asks Rick to flee to a safe place, but as a member of the royalty he feels responsible for dealing with this attack. So he attacks one of the slimes that was lurking nearby and destroys it with a single blow. The guards realize that Rick didn't become the sword master for nothing, but now he would have to prove his worth because the candidates for Sage have broken the seal of the Dark God. In another corner of the city, Holerus, the Archbishop of the Church of Mani, celebrates Mana's return and her manifestation on Earth, but Takatu's group appears behind him through a shortcut and Alpha Omega eliminates the bishop without conversation as he sensed his intention to kill. Hanakawa asks why he did that, why that bishop is connected to the dark god and alive he could spill the beans about his evil plans. Looking around, the group realizes they're somewhere in the Divine King's throne, and from the balcony, they see the slime taking over every corner of the capital. Faced with this, Hanakawa assumes it's his fault, but that he had no choice but to break the seal of this dark goddess who was in the underworld. At that moment, Mana appears and comments on the perfect timing to reunite with Hanakawa, and Takatu says he didn't know the two were that intimate. Then Mana asks Hanakoa to guide her to Yajuri Takatu, the man who killed her older brother. Without ceremony, the boy points his finger at the wanted man and rats out his friend, so Mana asks if it was really him who killed her brother. As Takatu confirms the suspicion, even without being sure of it, Mana stretches out her hands and warns that he will die, but Takatu advances and finishes off the enemy first, turning the imposing dark goddess into a pit of slime. Hanakawa emphasizes how amazing this angry kid named Takatu is, but the protagonist hasn't forgotten the disgrace the healer caused seconds ago. The group wonders what should be done about all the mess caused by the slime, so David invites everyone to join him on the roof because there's a wing machine identical to the one on the roof of the royal palace. Takatu jokes with Hanakawa that only five people fit inside and he'll have to figure something out, but the healer can't even consider taking this possibility lightly. However, indeed the transport couldn't take everyone at once, so Mokomoko tells everyone to leave and stays behind with Demura and Takatu. Danara asks why they ended up paying the price after all, so the ghost explains that she's been researching a technique for a long time, and then applies a spell that transforms her niece's armor into a tight dress with a cape, which according to the ghost calculations, is capable of flying. As for the boy, he must hold on tight to the girl for a ride. Without thinking twice, Takatu grabs his flying friend's waist, and besides squirming for the lack of modesty and suddenly grabbing her, Danara points out that anyone could do that in place of this guy, but Mokomoko argues that this way it's much more fun. So the duo prepares to depart and Danura takes flight with her new outfit, carrying Takatu. Upon landing outside the gates of Mani, Takatu asks what the next step will be, but after a long day, all Danura wants is to rest a little. David offers to guide everyone to a nearby city, while the group notices that Hanakawa has disappeared. 
Takatu remembers he has no obligation to carry that baggage along with him, so he doesn't care. Carol and Ryuko ask if they can accompany Takatu, and he doesn't object, but makes it clear that he'll only gather enough energy for him and Danura to return to their original world. Danura asks if that's proper manners, but the guy simply doesn't want to take responsibility for two more people besides them. Anyway, the two don't mind because they just want to accompany Takatu for as long as possible. With that settled, a deadly drowsiness hits the boy, and he asks Danura to carry him in her arms. The girl, of course, refuses the proposal, but Ryuko takes it seriously and offers to serve as a mule. Danura tells the girl not to get too cozy with him, otherwise it will only get worse, but the samurai is taking this conversation too seriously and emphasizes that they need to take care of Takatu. However, at that moment, a carriage appears from which Risley emerges and she introduces herself enthusiastically to the young man. Takatu asks if the girl needs anything, and as soon as she asks the boy to marry her, she is instantly rejected. Behind Risley, Theodisia and Euphemia appear, explaining to the little one that's not how you get things done. Takatu asks if Theodisia found her sister, but the demon says the story is a bit more complicated than that. Finally, Risley shows a philosopher's stone and offers it to Takatu he pays attention to her at that moment. Hey folks, another anime wrapping up its first season and stay tuned to this channel because we've got a bunch of new anime coming your way from the new season starting this week. So if you haven't already subscribed, hit that subscribe button below and I'll catch you in the next video.